Introduction to My Antonia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. My Antonia by Willa Cather. To Carrie and Irene Minor, in memory of affections old and true. Introduction. Last summer I happened to be crossing the plains of Iowa in a season of intense heat, and it was my good fortune to have for a travelling companion James Quayle Burden, Jim Burden, as we still call him in the West. He and I are old friends, we grew up together in the same Nebraska town, and we had much to say to each other. While the train flashed through never-ending miles of ripe wheat, by country towns and bright-flowered pastures and oak groves wilting in the sun, we sat in the observation car, where the woodwork was hot to the touch, and red dust lay deep over everything. The dust and heat, the burning wind, reminded us of many things. We were talking about what it is like to spend one's childhood in little towns like these, buried in wheat and corn, under stimulating extremes of climate, burning summers when the world lies green and billowy beneath a brilliant sky, when one is fairly stifled in vegetation, in the colour and smell of strong weeds and heavy harvests, blustery winters with little snow, when the whole country is stripped bare and grey as sheet-iron. We agreed that no one who had not grown up in a little prairie town could know anything about it. It was a kind of freemasonry, we said. Although Jim Burden and I both live in New York, and are old friends, I do not see much of him there. He is legal counsel for one of the great western railways, and is sometimes away from his New York office for weeks together. That is one reason why we do not often meet. Another is that I do not like his wife." When Jim was still an obscure young lawyer, struggling to make his way in New York, his career was suddenly advanced by a brilliant marriage. Genevieve Whitney was the only daughter of a distinguished man. Her marriage with young Burden was the subject of sharp comment at the time. It was said that she had been brutally jilted by her cousin, Rutland Whitney, and that she married this unknown man from the West out of bravado. She was a restless, headstrong girl, even then, who liked to astonish her friends. Later, when I knew her, she was always doing something unexpected. She gave one of her townhouses for a suffrage headquarters, produced one of her own plays at the Princess Theatre, was arrested for picketing during a garment-maker's strike, etc. I am never able to believe that she has much feeling for the causes to which she lends her name and her fleeting interest. She is handsome, energetic, executive, but to me she seems unimpressionable and temperamentally incapable of enthusiasm. Her husband's quiet tastes irritate her, I think, and she finds it worth while to play the patroness to a group of young poets and painters of advanced ideas and mediocre ability. She has her own fortune and lives her own life. For some reason she wishes to remain Mrs. James Burden. As for Jim, no disappointments have been severe enough to chill his naturally romantic and ardent disposition. This disposition, although it often made him seem very funny when he was a boy, has been one of the strongest elements in his success. He loves with a personal passion the great country through which his railway runs and branches. His faith in it and his knowledge of it have played an important part in its development. He is always able to raise capital for new enterprises in Wyoming or Montana, and has helped young men out there to do remarkable things in mines and timber and oil. If a young man with an idea can once get Jim Burden's attention, can manage to accompany him when he goes off into the wilds hunting for lost parks or exploring new canyons, then the money which means action is usually forthcoming. Jim is still able to lose himself in those big western dreams. Though he is over forty now, he meets new people and new enterprises with the impulsiveness by which his boyhood friends remember him. He never seems to me to grow older. His fresh colour and sandy hair and quick-changing blue eyes are those of a young man, and his sympathetic, solicitous interest in women is as youthful as it is Western and American. During that burning day when we were crossing Iowa, our talk kept returning to a central figure, a bohemian girl whom we had known long ago and whom both of us admired. More than any other person we remembered, this girl seemed to mean to us the country— the conditions, the whole adventures of our childhood. To speak her name was to call up pictures of people and places, to set a quiet drama going in one's brain. I had lost sight of her altogether, but Jim had found her again after long years, had renewed a friendship that meant a great deal to him, and out of his busy life had set apart enough time to enjoy that friendship. His mind was full of her that day. 
He made me see her again, feel her presence, revived all my old affection for her. "'I can't see,' he said impetuously, "'why you have never written anything about Antonia.' I told him I had always felt that other people, he himself, for one, knew her much better than I. I was ready, however, to make an agreement with him. I would set down on paper all that I remembered of Antonia, if he would do the same. We might, in this way, get a picture of her. He rumpled his hair with a quick, excited gesture, which with him often announces a new determination, and I could see that my suggestion took hold of him. Maybe I will. Maybe I will, he declared. He stared out of the window for a few moments, and when he turned to me again his eyes had the sudden clearness that comes from something the mind itself sees. "'Of course,' he said. "'I should have to do it in a direct way, and say a great deal about myself. It's through myself that I knew and felt her, and I've had no practice in any other form of presentation.' I told him that how he knew her and felt her was exactly what I most wanted to know about Antonia. He had had opportunities that I, as a little girl who watched her come and go, had not. Months afterward, Jim Burden arrived at my apartment one stormy winter afternoon, with a bulging legal portfolio sheltered under his fur overcoat. He brought it into the sitting-room with him, and tapped it with some pride as he stood warming his hands. "'I finished it last night. The thing about Antonia,' he said. "'Now what about yours?' I had to confess that mine had not gone beyond a few straggling notes. "'Notes? I didn't make any.' He drank his tea all at once, and put down the cup. I didn't arrange or rearrange. I simply wrote down what of herself and myself and other people Antonia's name recalls to me. I suppose it hasn't any form. It hasn't any title, either. He went into the next room, sat down at my desk, and wrote on the pinkish face of the portfolio the word, Antonia. He frowned at this a moment, then prefixed another word, making it, My Antonia. That seemed to satisfy him. "'Read it as soon as you can,' he said, rising, "'but don't let it influence your own story.' My own story was never written, but the following narrative is Jim's manuscript, substantially as he brought it to me. Book One, Chapter One, of My Antonia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Katie Gibbony, Arkansas, February 2008. My Antonia by Willa Cather, Book One, The Shimerdas, Chapter One. I first heard of Antonia on what seemed to me an interminable journey across the great Midland Plain of North America. I was ten years old then, I had lost both my father and mother within a year, and my Virginia relatives were sending me out to my grandparents, who lived in Nebraska. I traveled in the care of a mountain boy, Jake Marpole, one of the hands on my father's old farm under the Blue Ridge, who was now going west to work for my grandfather. Jake's experience of the world was not much wider than mine. He had never been in a railway train until the morning when we set out together to try our fortunes in a new world. We went all the way in day coaches, becoming more sticky and grimy with each stage of the journey. Jake bought everything the newsboys offered him, candy, oranges, brass collar buttons, a watch charm, and for me a Life of Jesse James, which I remember as one of the most satisfactory books I have ever read. Beyond Chicago we were under the protection of a friendly passenger conductor, who knew all about the country to which we were going, and gave us a great deal of advice in exchange for our confidence. He seemed to us an experienced and worldly man, who had been almost everywhere. In his conversation he threw out lightly the names of distant states and cities. He wore the rings and pins and badges of different fraternal orders to which he belonged. Even his cuff buttons were engraved with hieroglyphics, and he was more inscribed than an Egyptian obelisk. Once, when he sat down to chat, he told us that in the immigrant car ahead there was a family from across the water whose destination was the same as ours. They can't any of them speak English, except one little girl, and all she can say is, We go Black Hawk, Nebraska. She's not much older than you, twelve or thirteen maybe, and she's as bright as a new dollar. 
Don't you want to go ahead and see her, Jimmy? She's got the pretty brown eyes, too. This last remark made me bashful, and I shook my head and settled down to Jesse James. Jake nodded at me approvingly and said you were likely to get diseases from foreigners. I do not remember crossing the Missouri River or anything about the long day's journey through Nebraska. Probably by that time I had crossed so many rivers that I was dull to them. The only thing very noticeable about Nebraska was that it was still, all day long, Nebraska. I had been sleeping, curled up in a red plush seat, for a long while when we reached Black Hawk. Jake roused me and took me by the hand. We stumbled down from the train to a wooden siding where men were running about with lanterns. I couldn't see any town or even distant lights. We were surrounded by utter darkness. The engine was panting heavily after its long run. In the red glow from the firebox, a group of people stood huddled together on the platform, encumbered by bundles and boxes. I knew this must be the immigrant family the conductor had told us about. The woman wore a fringed shawl tied over her head, and she carried a little tin trunk in her arms, hugging it as if it were a baby. There was an old man, tall and stooped. Two half-grown boys and a girl stood holding oilcloth bundles, and a little girl clung to her mother's skirts. Presently a man with a lantern approached them and began to talk, shouting and exclaiming. I pricked up my ears, for it was positively the first time I had ever heard a foreign tongue. Another lantern came along. A bantering voice called out, Hello, are you Mr. Burden's folks? If you are, it's me you're looking for. I'm Otto Fuchs. I'm Mr. Burden's hired man, and I'm to drive you out. Hello, Jimmy. Ain't you scared to come so far west? I looked up with interest at the new face in the lantern light. He might have stepped out of the pages of Jesse James. He wore a sombrero hat with a wide leather band and a bright buckle and the ends of his mustache were twisted up stiffly like little horns. He looked lively and ferocious, I thought, and as if he had a history. A long scar ran across one cheek and drew the corner of his mouth up in a sinister curl. The top of his left ear was gone, and his skin was brown as an Indian's. Surely this was the face of a desperado. As he walked about the platform in his high-heeled boots, looking for our trunks, I saw that he was rather a slight man, quick and wiry and light on his feet. He told us we had a long night drive ahead of us and had better be on the hike. He led us to a hitching bar where two farm wagons were tied, and I saw the foreign family crowding into one of them. The other was for us. Jake got on the front seat with Otto Fuchs, and I rode on the straw in the bottom of the wagon box, covered up with a buffalo hide. The immigrants rumbled off into the empty darkness, and we followed them. I tried to go to sleep, but the jolting made me bite my tongue, and I soon began to ache all over. When the straw settled down I had a hard bed. Cautiously I slipped from under the buffalo hide, got up on my knees and peered over the side of the wagon. There seemed to be nothing to see, no fences, no creeks or trees, no hills or fields. If there was a road, I could not make it out in the faint starlight. There was nothing but land, not a country at all, but the material out of which countries are made. No, there was nothing but land, slightly undulating, I knew, because often our wheels ground against the brake as we went down into a hollow and lurched up again on the other side. I had the feeling that the world was left behind, that we had got over the edge of it and were outside man's jurisdiction. I had never before looked up at the sky when there was not a familiar mountain ridge against it, but this was the complete dome of heaven, all there was of it. I did not believe that my dead father and mother were watching me from up there. They would still be looking for me at the sheepfold down by the creek, or along the white road that led to the mountain pastures. I had left even their spirits behind me. The wagon jolted on, carrying me I knew not whither. I don't think I was homesick. If we never arrived anywhere, it did not matter. Between that earth and that sky I felt erased, blotted out. I did not say my prayers that night. Here I felt what would be, would be. Chapter 2 
I do not remember our arrival at my grandfather's farm some time before daybreak, after a drive of nearly twenty miles with heavy work horses. When I awoke, it was afternoon. I was lying in a little room, scarcely larger than the bed that held me, and the window shade at my head was flapping softly in a warm wind. A tall woman, with wrinkled brown skin and black hair, stood looking down at me. I knew that she must be my grandmother. She had been crying, I could see, but when I opened my eyes she smiled, peered at me anxiously, and sat down on the foot of my bed. "'Had a good sleep, Jimmy?' she asked briskly. Then in a very different tone she said, as if to herself, "'My, how you do look like your father!' I remembered that my father had been her little boy. She must often have come to wake him like this when he overslept. "'Here are your clean clothes,' she went on, stroking my coverlid with her brown hand as she talked. "'But first you come down to the kitchen with me, and have a nice warm bath behind the stove. Bring your things. There's nobody about.' Down to the kitchen struck me as curious. It was always out in the kitchen at home. I picked up my shoes and stockings and followed her through the living room and down a flight of stairs into a basement. This basement was divided into a dining room at the right of the stairs and a kitchen at the left. Both rooms were plastered and whitewashed. The plaster lay directly upon the earth walls, as it used to be in dugouts. The floor was of hard cement. Up under the wooden ceiling there were little half-windows with white curtains and pots of geraniums and wandering Jew in the deep sills. As I entered the kitchen I sniffed a pleasant smell of gingerbread baking. The stove was very large, with bright nickel trimmings, and behind it there was a long wooden bench against the wall, and a tin wash-tub, into which Grandmother poured hot and cold water. When she brought the soap and towels, I told her that I was used to taking my bath without help. "'Can you do your ears, Jimmy? Are you sure? Well, now, I call you a right smart little boy.' It was pleasant there in the kitchen. The sun shone into my bath water through the west half window, and a big Maltese cat came up and rubbed himself against the tub, watching me curiously. While I scrubbed, my grandmother busied herself in the dining room until I called anxiously. "'Grandmother, I'm afraid the cakes are burning.' Then she came laughing, waving her apron before her as if she were shooing chickens. She was a spare, tall woman, a little stooped, and she was apt to carry her head thrust forward in an attitude of attention, as if she were looking at something, or listening to something far away. As I grew older I came to believe that it was only because she was so often thinking of things that were far away. She was quick-footed and energetic in all her movements. Her voice was high and rather shrill and she often spoke with an anxious inflection, for she was exceedingly desirous that everything should go with due order and decorum. Her laugh, too, was high, and perhaps a little strident, but there was a lively intelligence in it. She was then fifty-five years old, a strong woman, of unusual endurance. After I was dressed, I explored the long cellar next the kitchen. It was dug out under the wing of the house, was plastered and cemented, with a stairway and an outside door by which the men came and went. Under one of the windows there was a place for them to wash when they came in from work. While my grandmother was busy about supper, I settled myself on the wooden bench behind the stove and got acquainted with the cat. He caught not only rats and mice, but gophers, I was told. The patch of yellow sunlight on the floor traveled back toward the stairway, and grandmother and I talked about my journey and about the arrival of the new Bohemian family. She said they were to be our nearest neighbors. We did not talk about the farm in Virginia, which had been her home for so many years. But after the men came in from the fields, and we were all seated at the supper table, then she asked Jake about the old place and about our friends and neighbors there. My grandfather said little. When he first came in he kissed me and spoke kindly to me, but he was not demonstrative. I felt at once his deliberateness and personal dignity, and was a little in awe of him. The thing one immediately noticed about him was his beautiful, crinkly, snow-white beard. I once heard a missionary say it was like the beard of an Arabian sheik. His bald crown only made it more impressive. Grandfather's eyes were not at all like those of an old man. They were bright blue and had a fresh frosty sparkle. His teeth were white and regular, so sound that he had never been to a dentist in his life. He had a delicate skin, easily roughened by sun and wind. 
When he was a young man his hair and beard were red, his eyebrows were still coppery. As we sat at the table, Otto Fuchs and I kept stealing covert glances at each other. Grandmother had told me while she was getting supper that he was an Austrian, who came to this country a young boy, and had led an adventurous life in the far west, among mining camps and cow outfits. His iron constitution was somewhat broken by mountain pneumonia, and he had drifted back to live in a milder country for a while. He had relatives in Bismarck, a German settlement to the north of us, but for a year now he had been working for Grandfather. The minute supper was over, Otto took me into the kitchen to whisper to me about a pony down in the barn that had been bought for me at a sale. He had been riding him to find out whether he had any bad tricks, but he was a perfect gentleman, and his name was Dude. Fuchs told me everything I wanted to know, how he had lost his ear in a Wyoming blizzard when he was a stage driver, and how to throw a lasso. He promised to rope a steer for me before sundown next day. He got out his chaps and silver spurs to show them to Jake and me, and his best cowboy boots, with tops stitched in bold design, roses, and true lover's knots, and undraped female figures. These, he solemnly explained, were angels. Before we went to bed, Jake and Otto were called up to the living room for prayers. Grandfather put on silver-rimmed spectacles and read several psalms. His voice was so sympathetic, and he read so interestingly, that I wished he had chosen one of my favorite chapters in the Book of Kings. I was awed by his intonation of the word, Selah. He shall choose our inheritance for us, the excellency of Jacob whom he loved, Selah. I had no idea what the word meant, perhaps he had not, but, as he uttered it, it became oracular, the most sacred of words. Early the next morning I ran out of doors to look about me. I had been told that ours was the only wooden house west of Black Hawk, until you came to the Norwegian settlement where there were several. Our neighbors lived in sod houses and dugouts, comfortable but not very roomy. Our white frame house, with a story and half story above the basement, stood at the east end of what I might call the farmyard, with the windmill close by the kitchen door. From the windmill the ground sloped westward, down to the barns and granaries and pig yards. This slope was trampled hard and bare and washed out in winding gullies by the rain. Beyond the corn cribs, at the bottom of the shallow draw, was a muddy little pond, with rusty willow bushes growing about it. The road from the post office came directly by our door, crossed the farmyard, and curved round this little pond, beyond which it began to climb the gentle swell of unbroken prairie to the west. There, along the western skyline, it skirted a great cornfield, much larger than any field I had ever seen. This cornfield, and the sorghum patch behind the barn, were the only broken land in sight. Everywhere, as far as the eye could reach, there was nothing but rough, shaggy, red grass, most of it as tall as I. North of the house, inside the plowed fire breaks, grew a thick-set strip of box elder trees, low and bushy, their leaves already turning yellow. This hedge was nearly a quarter of a mile long, but I had to look very hard to see it at all. The little trees were insignificant against the grass. It seemed as if the grass were about to run over them and over the plum patch behind the sawed chicken house. As I looked about me, I felt that the grass was the country, as the water is the sea. The red of the grass made all the great prairie the color of wine stains, or of certain seaweeds when they are first washed up. And there was so much motion in it, the whole country seemed, somehow, to be running. I had almost forgotten that I had a grandmother, when she came out, her sunbonnet on her head, a grain sack in her hand, and asked me if I did not want to go to the garden with her to dig potatoes for dinner. The garden, curiously enough, was a quarter of a mile from the house, and the way to it led up a shallow draw past the cattle corral. Grandmother called my attention to a stout hickory cane, tipped with copper, which hung by a leather thong from her belt. This, she said, was her rattlesnake cane. I must never go to the garden without a heavy stick or a corn knife. She had killed a good many rattlers on her way back and forth. A little girl who lived on the Black Hawk Road was bitten on the ankle and had been sick all summer. 
I can remember exactly how the country looked to me as I walked beside my grandmother along the faint wagon tracks on that early September morning. Perhaps the glide of long railway travel was still with me, for more than anything else I felt motion in the landscape, in the fresh, easy-blowing morning wind, and in the earth itself, as if the shaggy grass were a sort of loose hide, and underneath it herds of wild buffalo were galloping, galloping. Alone, I should never have found the garden, except, perhaps, for the big yellow pumpkins that lay about unprotected by their withering vines. And I felt very little interest in it when I got there. I wanted to walk straight on through the red grass and over the edge of the world, which could not be very far away. The light air about me told me that the world ended here, only the ground and sun and sky were left, and if one went a little farther there would be only sun and sky, and one would float off into them like the tawny hawks which sailed over our heads, making slow shadows on the grass. While Grandmother took the pitchfork, we found standing in one of the rows, and dug potatoes. While I picked them up out of the soft brown earth and put them into the bag, I kept looking up at the hawks that were doing what I might so easily do. When Grandmother was ready to go, I said I would like to stay up there in the garden a while. She peered down at me from under her sunbonnet. Aren't you afraid of snakes? A little, I admitted, but I'd like to stay anyhow. Well, if you see one, don't have anything to do with him. The big yellow and brown ones won't hurt you. They're bull snakes and help to keep the gophers down. Don't be scared if you see anything look out of that hole in the bank over there. That's a badger hole. He's about as big as a possum, and his face is striped, black and white. He takes a chicken once in a while, but I won't let the men harm him. In a new country, a body feels friendly to the animals. I like to have him come out and watch me when I'm at work. Grandmother swung the bag of potatoes over her shoulder and went down the path, leaning forward a little. The road followed the windings of the draw. When she came to the first bend, she waved at me and disappeared. I was left alone with this new feeling of lightness and content. I sat down in the middle of the garden, where snakes could scarcely approach unseen, and leaned my back against a warm yellow pumpkin. There were some ground cherry bushes growing along the furrows, full of fruit. I turned back the papery triangular sheaths that protected the berries and ate a few. All about me giant grasshoppers, twice as big as any I had ever seen, were doing acrobatic feats among the dried vines. The gophers scurried up and down the plowed ground. There in the sheltered draw bottom the wind did not blow very hard, but I could hear it singing its humming tune up on the level, and I could see the tall grasses wave. The earth was warm under me, and warm as I crumbled it through my fingers. Queer little red bugs came out and moved in slow squadrons around me. Their backs were polished vermilion with black spots. I kept as still as I could. Nothing happened. I did not expect anything to happen. I was something that lay under the sun and felt it, like the pumpkins, and I did not want to be anything more. I was entirely happy. Perhaps we feel like that when we die, and become a part of something entire, whether it is sun and air, or goodness and knowledge. At any rate, that is happiness, to be dissolved into something complete and great. When it comes to one, it comes as naturally as sleep. Chapter 3 On Sunday morning, Otto Fuchs was to drive us over to make the acquaintance of our new Bohemian neighbors. We were taking them some provisions, as they had come to live on a wild place where there was no garden or chicken house, and very little broken land. Fuchs brought up a sack of potatoes and a piece of cured pork from the cellar, and Grandmother packed some loaves of Saturday's bread, a jar of butter, and several pumpkin pies in the straw of the wagon box. We clambered up to the front seat and jolted off past the little pond and along the road that climbed to the big cornfield. I could hardly wait to see what lay beyond that cornfield, but there was only red grass like ours and nothing else, though from the high wagon seat one could look off a long way. The road ran about like a wild thing, avoiding the deep draws, crossing them where they were wide and shallow. 
And all along it, wherever it looped or ran, the sunflowers grew. Some of them were as big as little trees, with great rough leaves and many branches which bore dozens of blossoms. They made a gold ribbon across the prairie. Occasionally one of the horses would tear off, with his teeth, a plant full of blossoms, and walk along munching it, the flowers nodding in time to his bites as he ate down toward them. The Bohemian family, grandmother told me as we drove along, had bought the homestead of a fellow countryman, Peter Cragic, and had paid him more than it was worth. Their agreement with him was made before they left the old country, through a cousin of his, who was also a relative of Mrs. Shimerda. The Shimerdas were the first Bohemian family to come to this part of the country. Cratchit was their only interpreter, and could tell them anything he chose. They could not speak enough English to ask for advice, or even to make their most pressing wants known. One son, Fuchs said, was well grown and strong enough to work the land, but the father was old and frail, and knew nothing about farming. He was a weaver by trade, and had been a skillful workman on tapestries and upholstery materials. He had brought his fiddle with him, which wouldn't be of much use here, though he used to pick up money by it at home. If they're nice people, I hate to think of them spending the winter in that cave of Cragic's, said Grandmother. It's no better than a badger hole, no proper dugout at all. And I hear he's made them pay twenty dollars for his old cook stove that ain't worth ten. Yes, em, said Otto. And he sold em his oxen and his two bony old horses for the price of good work teams. I'd have interfered about the horses. The old man can understand some German. If I'd have thought it would do any good, Bohemians has a natural distrust of Austrians. Grandmother looked interested. Now, why is that, Otto? Fuchs wrinkled his brow and nose. Well, ma'am, it's politics. It would take me a long while to explain. The land was growing rougher. I was told that we were approaching Squaw Creek, which cut up the west half of the Shemirda's place and made the land of little value for farming. Soon we could see the broken grassy clay cliffs which indicated the windings of the stream and the glittering tops of the cottonwoods and ash trees that grew down the ravine. Some of the cottonwoods had already turned, and the yellow leaves and shining white bark made them look like gold and silver trees in fairy tales. As we approached the Shemirda's dwelling, I could still see nothing but rough red hillocks, and draws with shelving banks and long roots hanging out where the earth had crumbled away. Presently, Against one of those banks I saw a sort of shed, thatched with the same wine-colored grass that grew everywhere. Near it tilted a shattered windmill frame that had no wheel. We drove up to this skeleton to tie our horses, and then I saw a door and window sunk deep in the drawbank. The door stood open, and a woman and a girl of fourteen ran out and looked up at us hopefully. A little girl trailed along behind them. The woman had on her head the same embroidered shawl with silk fringes that she wore when she had alighted from the train at Black Hawk. She was not old, but she was certainly not young. Her face was alert and lively, with a sharp chin and shrewd little eyes. She shook Grandmother's hand energetically. "'Very glad, very glad!' she ejaculated. Immediately she pointed to the bank out of which she had emerged and said, "'House no good, house no good.' Grandmother nodded consolingly. "'You'll get fixed up comfortable after a while, Mrs. Schmerda. Make good house.' My grandmother always spoke in a very loud tone to foreigners, as if they were deaf. She made Mrs. Schmerda understand the friendly intention of our visit, and the Bohemian woman handled the loaves of bread, and even smelled them, and examined the pies with lively curiosity, exclaiming, Much good! Much thank! And again she wrung grandmother's hand. The oldest son, Ambrose, they called it Ambrosch, came out of the cave and stood beside his mother. He was nineteen years old, short and broad-backed, 
with a close-cropped flat head and a wide flat face. His hazel eyes were little and shrewd, like his mother's, but more sly and suspicious. They fairly snapped at the food. The family had been living on corn cakes and sorghum molasses for three days. The little girl was pretty, but Antonia, they accented the name thus, strongly, when they spoke to her, was still prettier. I remembered what the conductor had said about her eyes. They were big and warm and full of light, like the sun shining on brown pools in the wood. Her skin was brown, too, and in her cheeks she had a glow of rich, dark color. Her brown hair was curly and wild-looking. The little sister, whom they called Julka, was fair, and seemed mild and obedient. While I stood awkwardly confronting the two girls, Krajik came up from the barn to see what was going on. With him was another Shemirda son. Even from a distance one could see that there was something strange about this boy. As he approached us, he began to make uncouth noises, and held up his hands to show us his fingers, which were webbed to the first knuckle, like a duck's foot. When he saw me draw back, he began to crow delightedly, hoo 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 like a rooster. His mother scowled and said sternly, Marek! then spoke rapidly to Krajik in Bohemian. She wants me to tell you that he won't hurt nobody, Mrs. Burden. He was born like that. The others are smart. Ambrose, he make good farmer. He struck Ambrose on the back, and the boy smiled knowingly. At that moment the father came out of the hole in the bank. He wore no hat, and his thick iron-gray hair was brushed straight back from his forehead. It was so long that it bushed out behind his ears and made him look like the old portraits I remember in Virginia. He was tall and slender, and his thin shoulders stooped. He looked at us understandingly, then took Grandmother's hand and bent over it. I noticed how white and well-shaped his own hands were. They looked calm somehow, and skilled. His eyes were melancholy, and were set back deep under his brow. His face was ruggedly formed but it looked like ashes, like something from which all the warmth and light had died out. Everything about this man was in keeping with his dignified manner. He was neatly dressed. Under his coat he wore a knitted gray vest, and instead of a collar a silk scarf of a dark bronze green, carefully crossed and held together by a red coral pen. While Krajik was translating for Mrs. Shimerda, Antonia came up to me and held out her hand coaxingly. In a moment we were running up the steep draw side together, Julka trotting after us. When we reached the level where we could see the golden tree tops, I pointed toward them, and Antonia laughed and squeezed my hand as if to tell me how glad she was I had come. We raced off toward Squaw Creek, and did not stop until the ground itself stopped, fell away before us so abruptly that the next step would have been out into the treetops. We stood panting on the edge of the ravine, looking down at the trees and bushes that grew below us. The wind was so strong that I had to hold my hat on, and the girls' skirts were blown out before them. Antonia seemed to like that. She held her little sister by the hand, and chattered away in that language which seemed to me spoken so much more rapidly than mine. She looked at me, her eyes fairly blazing with things she could not say. "'Name? What name?' she asked, touching me on the shoulder. I told her my name, and she repeated it after me, and made Julka say it. She pointed into the gold cottonwood tree behind whose top we stood, and said again, "'What name?' We sat down and made a nest in the long red grass. Julka curled up like a baby rabbit and played with a grasshopper. Antonia pointed up to the sky, and questioned me with her glance. I gave her the word, but she was not satisfied, and pointed into my eyes. I told her, and she repeated the word, making it sound like ice. She pointed up to the sky, then to my eyes, then back to the sky, with movements so quick and impulsive that she distracted me, and I had no idea what she wanted. She got up on her knees and wrung her hands. She pointed to her own eyes and shook her head, then to mine and to the sky, nodding violently. 
Oh, I exclaimed, blue, blue sky. She clapped her hands and murmured, blue sky, blue eyes, <laughs> as if it amused her. While we snuggled down there out of the wind, she learned a score of words. She was quick and very eager. We were so deep in the grass that we could see nothing but the blue sky over us and the gold tree in front of us. It was wonderfully pleasant. After Antonia had said the new words over and over, she wanted to give me a little chased silver ring that she wore on her middle finger. When she coaxed and insisted, I repulsed her quite sternly. I didn't want her ring and I felt there was something reckless and extravagant about her wishing to give it away to a boy she had never seen before. No wonder Krajic had got the better of these people, if this was how they behaved. While we were disputing over the ring, I heard a mournful voice calling, Antonia! Antonia! She sprang up like a hare. Tatanek! Tatanek! She shouted, and we ran to meet the old man who was coming toward us. Antonia reached him first, took his hand, and kissed it. When I came up, he touched my shoulder and looked searchingly down into my face for several seconds. I became somewhat embarrassed, for I was used to being taken for granted by my elders. We went with Mr. Shimerda back to the dugout, where Grandmother was waiting for me. Before I got into the wagon, he took a book out of his pocket, opened it, and showed me a page with two alphabets one English and the other Bohemian. He placed this book in my grandmother's hands, looked at her entreatingly, and said with an earnestness which I shall never forget, Teach! Teach my Antonia! Chapter 4 On the afternoon of that same Sunday, I took my first long ride on my pony, under Otto's direction. After that dude, I went twice a week to the post office, six miles east of us, and I saved the men a good deal of time by writing on errands to our neighbors. When we had to borrow anything, or to send about word that there would be preaching at the sod schoolhouse, I was always the messenger. Formerly, folks attended to such things after working hours. All the years that have passed have not dimmed my memory of that first glorious autumn. The new country lay open before me. There were no fences in those days, and I could choose my own way over the grass uplands, trusting the pony to get me home again. Sometimes I followed the sunflower-bordered roads. Fuchs told me that the sunflowers were introduced into that country by the Mormons, that at the time of the persecution, when they left Missouri and struck out into the wilderness to find a place where they could worship God in their own way, the members of the first exploring party, crossing the plains to Utah, scattered sunflower seeds as they went. The next summer, when the long trains of wagons came through with all the women and children, they had the sunflower trail to follow. I believe that botanists do not confirm Jake's story, but insist that the sunflower was native to those plains. Nevertheless, the legend has stuck in my mind and sunflower-bordered roads always seemed to me the roads to freedom. I used to love to drift along the pale yellow cornfields, looking for the damp spots one sometimes found at their edges, where the smart weed soon turned a rich copper color, and the narrow brown leaves hung curled like cocoons about the swollen joints of the stem. Sometimes I went south to visit our German neighbors, and to admire their catalpa grove, or to see the big elm tree that grew up out of the deep crack in the earth and had a hawk's nest in its branches. Trees were so rare in that country, and they had to make such a hard fight to grow, that we used to feel anxious about them and visit them as if they were persons. It must have been the scarcity of detail in that tawny landscape that made detail so precious. Sometimes I rode north, to the prairie dog town, to watch the brown earth owls fly home in the late afternoon, or go down to their nests underground with the dogs. Antonia Shimirda liked to go with me, and we used to wonder a great deal about these birds of subterranean habit. We had to be on our guard there, for rattlesnakes were always lurking about. They came to pick up an easy living among the dogs and owls, 
which were quite defenseless against them, took possession of their comfortable houses, and ate their eggs and puppies. We felt sorry for the owls. It was always mournful to see them come flying home at sunset and disappear under the earth. But, after all, we felt, winged things who would live like that must be rather degraded creatures. The dog town was a long way from any pond or creek. Otto Fuchs said he had seen populous dog towns in the desert where there was no surface water for fifty miles. He insisted that some of the holes must go down to water, nearly two hundred feet hereabouts. Antonia said she didn't believe it, that the dogs probably lapped up the dew in the early morning, like the rabbits. Antonia had opinions about everything, and she was soon able to make them known. Almost every day she came running across the prairie to have her reading lesson with me. Mrs. Shemirda grumbled, but realized it was important that one member of the family should learn English. When the lesson was over, we used to go up to the watermelon patch behind the garden. I split the melons with an old corn knife, and we lifted out the hearts, and ate them with juice trickling through our fingers. The white Christmas melons we did not touch, but we watched them with curiosity. They were to be picked late, when the hard frosts had set in, and put away for winter use. After weeks on the ocean, the Shemirdas were famished for fruit. The two girls would wander for miles along the edge of the cornfields, hunting for ground cherries. Antonia loved to help grandmother in the kitchen, and to learn about cooking and housekeeping. She would stand beside her, watching her every movement. We were willing to believe that Mrs. Shemirda was a good housewife in her own country, but she managed poorly under new conditions. The conditions were bad enough, certainly. I remember how horrified we were at the sour, ashy gray bread she gave her family to eat. She mixed her dough, we discovered, in an old tin peck measure that Cradgick had used about the barn. When she took the paste out to bake it, she left smears of dough sticking to the sides of the measure, put the measure back on the shelf behind the stove, and let this residue ferment. The next time she made bread, she scraped this sour stuff down into the fresh dough to serve as yeast. During those first months, the Shemirdas never went to town. Cradgick encouraged them in the belief that in Black Hawk they would somehow be mysteriously separated from their money. They hated Cradgick, but they clung to him because he was the only human being with whom they could talk, or from whom they could get information. He slept with the old man and the two boys in the dugout barn, along with the oxen. They kept him in their hole and fed him for the same reason that the prairie dogs and the brown owls housed rattlesnakes because they did not know how to get rid of him. CHAPTER Five. We knew that things were hard for our bohemian neighbors, but the two girls were light-hearted and never complained. They were always ready to forget their troubles at home, and to run away with me over the prairie, scaring rabbits, or starting up flocks of quail. I remember Antonia's excitement when she came into our kitchen one afternoon and announced, "'My papa find friends up north with Russian mans. Last night he take me for sea, and I can understand very much talk. Nice mans, Mrs. Burden. One is fat, and all the time laugh. Everybody laugh. The first time I see my papa laugh in this country. Oh, very nice.' I asked her if she meant the two Russians, who lived up by the big dog town. I had often been tempted to go to see them when I was riding in that direction, but one of them was a wild-looking fellow, and I was a little afraid of him. Russia seemed to me more remote than any other country, farther away than China, almost as far as the North Pole. Of all the strange, uprooted people among the first settlers, those two men were the strangest, and the most aloof. Their last names were unpronounceable, so they were called Pavel and Peter. They went about making signs to people, and until the Shemirdas came, they had no friends. Cratchit could understand them a little, but he had cheated them in a trade, so they avoided him. 
Pavel, the tall one, was said to be an anarchist, since he had no means of imparting his opinions, probably his wild gesticulations, and his generally excited and rebellious manner gave rise to this supposition. He must once have been a very strong man, but now his great frame, with big knotty joints, had a wasted look, and the skin was drawn tight over his high cheekbones. His breathing was hoarse, and he always had a cough. Peter, his companion, was a very different sort of fellow, short, bow-legged, and as fat as butter. He always seemed pleased when he met people on the road, smiled, and took off his cap to everyone, men as well as women. At a distance, on his wagon, he looked like an old man. His hair and beard were of such a pale flaxen color that they seemed white in the sun. They were as thick and curly as carded wool. His rosy face, with its snub nose, set in this fleece, was like a melon among leaves. He was usually called Curly Peter, or Russian Peter. The two Russians made good farmhands, and in the summer they worked out together. I had heard our neighbors laughing when they told how Peter always had to go home at night to milk his cow. Other bachelor homesteaders used canned milk to save trouble. Sometimes Peter came to church at the sod schoolhouse. It was there I first saw him, sitting on a low bench by the door, his plush cap in his hands, his bare feet tucked apologetically under the seat. After Mr. Shemirda discovered the Russians, he went to see them almost every evening, and sometimes took Antonia with him. She said that they came from a part of Russia where the language was not very different from Bohemian, and if I wanted to go to their place, she could talk to them for me. One afternoon, before the heavy frosts began, we rode up there together on my pony. The Russians had a neat log house, built on a grassy slope, with a windlass well beside the door. As we rode up the draw, we skirted a big melon patch, and a garden where squashes and yellow cucumbers lay about on the sod. We found Peter out behind his kitchen, bending over a wash-tub. He was working so hard that he did not hear us coming. His whole body moved up and down as he rubbed, and he was a funny sight from the rear, with his shaggy head and bandy legs. When he straightened himself up to greet us, drops of perspiration were rolling from his thick nose down on to his curly beard. Peter dried his hands and seemed glad to leave his washing. He took us down to see his chickens and his cow that was grazing on the hillside. He told Antonia that in his country only rich people had cows, but here any man could have one who could take care of her. The milk was good for Pavel, who was often sick, and he could make butter by beating sour cream with a wooden spoon. Peter was very fond of his cow. He patted her flanks and talked to her in Russian, while he pulled up her lariat pen and set it in a new place. After he had shown us his garden, Peter trundled a load of watermelons up the hill in his wheelbarrow. Pavel was not at home. He was off somewhere helping to dig a well. The house I thought very comfortable for two men who were batching. Besides the kitchen, there was a living room with a wide double bed built against the wall, properly made up with blue gingham sheets and pillows. There was a little storeroom, too, with a window, where they kept guns and saddles and tools, and old coats and boots. That day the floor was covered with garden things, drying for winter, corn and beans and fat yellow cucumbers. There were no screens or window blinds in the house, and all the doors and windows stood wide open, letting in flies and sunshine alike. Peter put the melons in a row on the oilcloth-covered table and stood over them, brandishing a butcher knife. Before the blade got fairly into them, they split of their own ripeness with a delicious sound. He gave us knives but no plates, and the top of the table was soon swimming with juice and seeds. I had never seen anyone eat so many melons as Peter ate. He assured us that they were very good for one, better than medicine. In his country, people lived on them at this time of the year. He was very hospitable and jolly. Once 
while he was looking at Antonia. He sighed, and told us that if he had stayed home in Russia, perhaps by this time he would have a pretty daughter of his own, to cook and keep house for him. He said he had left his country because of a great trouble. When we got up to go, Peter looked about in perplexity for something that would entertain us. He ran into the storeroom and brought out a gaudily painted harmonica, sat down on a bench, and spreading his fat legs apart, began to play like a whole band. The tunes were either very lively or very doleful, and he sang words to some of them. Before we left, Peter put ripe cucumbers into a sack for Mrs. Shemirda, and gave us a lard pail full of milk to cook them in. I had never heard of cooking cucumbers, but Antonia assured me that they were very good. We had to walk the pony all the way home to keep from spilling the milk. Book One, Chapter Six One afternoon we were having our reading lesson on the warm, grassy bank where the badger lived. It was a day of amber sunlight, but there was a shiver of coming winter in the air. I had seen ice on the little horse pond that morning, and as we went through the garden we found the tall asparagus with its red berries lying on the ground, a mass of slimy green. Tony was barefooted, and she shivered in her cotton dress and was comfortable only when we were tucked down on the baked earth in the full blaze of the sun. She could talk to me about almost anything by this time. That afternoon she was telling me how highly esteemed our friend the badger was in her part of the world, and how men kept a special kind of dog, with very short legs, to hunt him. Those dogs, she said, went down into the hole after the badger and killed him there in a terrific struggle underground. You could hear the barks and yelps outside. Then the dog dragged himself back, covered with bites and scratches, to be rewarded and petted by his master. She knew a dog who had a star on his collar for every badger he had killed. The rabbits were unusually spry that afternoon. They kept starting up all about us and dashing off down the draw as if they were playing a game of some kind. But the little buzzing things that lived in the grass were all dead. All but one. While we were lying there against the warm bank, a little insect of the palest, frailest green hopped painfully out of the buffalo grass and tried to leap into a bunch of blue stem. He missed it, fell back, and sat with his head sunk between his long legs, his antennae quivering as if he were waiting for something to come and finish him. Tony made a warm nest for him in her hands, talked to him gaily and indulgently in Bohemian. Presently, he began to sing for us, a thin, rusty little chirp. She held him close to her ear and laughed, but a moment afterward I saw there were tears in her eyes. She told me that in her village at home there was an old beggar woman who went about selling herbs and roots she had dug up in the forest. If you took her in and gave her a warm place by the fire, she sang old songs to the children in a cracked voice like this. Old Hatta, she was called, and the children loved to see her coming and save their cakes and sweets for her. When the bank on the other side of the draw began to throw a narrow shelf of shadow, we knew we ought to be starting homeward. The chill came on quickly when the sun got low, and Antonia's dress was thin. What were we to do with the frail little creature we had lured back to life by false pretenses? I offered my pockets, but Tony shook her head and carefully put the green insect in her hair, tying her big handkerchief down loosely over her curls. I said I would go with her until we could see Squaw Creek, and then turn and run home. We drifted along lazily, very happy, through the magical light of the late afternoon. All those fall afternoons were the same, but I never got used to them. As far as we could see, the miles of copper-red grass were drenched in sunlight that was stronger and fiercer than at any other time of the day. The blonde cornfields were red gold, the haystacks turned rosy, and threw long shadows. The whole prairie was like the bush that burned with fire and was not consumed. 
that hour always had the exaltation of victory, of triumphant ending, like a hero's death, heroes who died young and gloriously. It was a sudden transfiguration, a lifting up of day. How many an afternoon Antony and I have trailed along the prairie under that magnificence, and always two long black shadows flitted before us or followed after, dark spots on the ruddy grass. We had been silent a long time, and the edge of the sun sank nearer and nearer the prairie floor when we saw a figure moving on the edge of the upland, a gun over his shoulder. He was walking slowly, dragging his feet along as if he had no purpose. We broke into a run to overtake him. "'My papa sick all the time,' Tony panted as we flew. "'He not look good, Jim.' As we neared Mr. Shimerda, she shouted, and he lifted his head and peered about. Tony ran up to him, caught his hand, and pressed it against her cheek. She was the only one of his family who could rouse the old man from the torpor in which he seemed to live. He took the bag from his belt and showed us three rabbits he had shot, looked at Antonia with a wintry flicker of a smile, and began to tell her something. She turned to me. "'My tatnik make me little hat with the skins, little hat for winter,' she exclaimed joyfully. "'Meat for eat, skin for hat,' she told off these benefits on her fingers. Her father put his hand on her hair, but she caught his wrist and lifted it carefully away, talking to him rapidly. I heard the name old Hatta. He untied the handkerchief, separated her hair with his fingers, and stood looking down at the green insect. When it began to chirp faintly, he listened as if it were a beautiful sound. I picked up the gun he had dropped, a queer piece from the old country, short and heavy, with a stag's head on the cock. When he saw me examining it, he turned to me with his faraway look that always made me feel as if I were down at the bottom of a well. He spoke kindly and gravely, and Antonia translated, my tatnik say when you are big boy, he give you his gun, very fine, from Bohemi. It was belonged to a great man, very rich, like what you not got here, many fields, many forests, many big house. My papa play for his wedding, and he give my papa fine gun, and my papa give you. I was glad that this project was one of futurity. There never were such people as the Shemerdas for wanting to give away everything they had. Even the mother was always offering me things, though I knew she expected substantial presents in return. We stood there in friendly silence, while the feeble minstrel sheltered in Antonia's hair went on with its scratchy chirp. The old man's smile, as he listened, was so full of sadness, of pity for things, that I never afterward forgot it. As the sun sank, there came a sudden coolness and the strong smell of earth and drying grass. Antonia and her father went off hand in hand, and I buttoned up my jacket and raced my shadow home. Book One, Chapter Seven Much as I liked Antonia, I hated a superior tone that she sometimes took with me. She was four years older than I, to be sure, and had seen more of the world. But I was a boy, and she was a girl, and I resented her protecting manner. Before the autumn was over, she began to treat me more like an equal, and to defer to me in other things than reading lessons. This change came about from an adventure we had together. One day when I rode over to the Shemerdas, I found Antonia starting off on foot for Russian Peter's house to borrow a spade Ambrose needed. I offered to take her on the pony, and she got up behind me. There had been another black frost the night before, and the air was clear and heady as wine. Within a week, all the blooming roads had been despoiled. Hundreds of miles of yellow sunflowers had been transformed into brown, rattling, burry stalks. We found Russian Peter digging his potatoes. We were glad to go in and get warm by his kitchen stove, and to see his squashes and Christmas melons heaped in the storeroom for winter. As we rode away with the spade, Antonia suggested that we stop at the prairie dog town and dig into one of the holes. 
we could find out whether they ran straight down or were horizontal, like mole holes, whether they had underground connections, whether the owls had nests down there lined with feathers. We might get some puppies or owl eggs or snake skins. The dog town was spread out over perhaps 10 acres. The grass had been nibbled short and even, so this stretch was not shaggy and red like the surrounding country, but gray and velvety. The holes were several yards apart and were disposed with a good deal of regularity, almost as if the town had been laid out in streets and avenues. One always felt that an orderly and very sociable kind of life was going on there. I picketed Dude down in a draw and we went wandering about, looking for a hole that would be easy to dig. The dogs were out as usual, dozens of them, sitting up on their hind legs over the doors of their houses. As we approached, they barked, shook their tails at us, and scurried underground. Before the mouths of the holes were little patches of sand and gravel, scratched up, we supposed, from a long way below the surface. Here and there in the town we came on larger gravel patches, several yards away from any hole. If the dogs had scratched the sand up in excavating, how had they carried it so far? It was on one of these gravel beds that I met my adventure. We were examining a big hole with two entrances. The burrow sloped into the ground at a gentle angle so that we could see where the two corridors united, and the floor was dusty from use like a little highway over which much travel went. I was walking backward in a crouching position when I heard Antonia scream. She was standing opposite me, pointing behind me and shouting something in Bohemian. I whirled round, and there, on one of those dry gravel beds, was the biggest snake I had ever seen. He was sunning himself after the cold night, and he must have been asleep when Antonia screamed. When I turned, he was lying in long, loose waves, like a letter W., he twitched and began to coil slowly. He was not merely a big snake, I thought. He was a circus monstrosity. His abominable muscularity, his loathsome fluid motion, somehow made me sick. He was as thick as my leg and looked as if millstones couldn't crush the disgusting vitality out of him. He lifted his little, hideous little head and rattled. I didn't run because I didn't think of it. If my back had been against a stone wall, I couldn't have felt more cornered. I saw his coils tighten. Now he would spring, spring his length, I remembered. I ran up and drove at his head with my spade, struck him fairly across the neck, and in a minute he was all about my feet in wavy loops. I struck now from hate. Antonia, barefooted as she was, ran up behind me. Even after I had pounded his ugly head flat, his body kept on coiling and winding, doubling and falling back on itself. I walked away and turned my back. I felt seasick. Antonia came after me crying. Oh, Jimmy, he not bite you? You sure? You not run when I say? What you jabber bohunk for? You might have told me there was a snake behind me, I said petulantly. I know, I'm just awful, Jim. I was so scared. She took my handkerchief from my pocket and tried to wipe my face with it, but I snatched it away from her. I suppose I looked as sick as I felt. I never know you was so brave, Jim, she went on comfortingly. You was just like big man's. You wait for him, lift his head, and then you go for him. Ain't you feel scared a bit? Now we take that snake home and show everybody. Nobody ain't seen in this country so big snake like you kill. She went on in this strain until I began to think that I had longed for this opportunity and had hailed it with joy. Cautiously, we went back to the snake. He was still groping with his tail, turning up his ugly belly in the light. A faint, fetid smell came from him, and a thread of green liquid oozed from his crushed head. Look, Tony, that's his poison, I said. I took a long piece of string from my pocket, and she lifted his head with the spade while I tied a noose around it. We pulled him out straight and measured him by my riding quirt. He was about five and a half feet long. He had twelve rattles, but they were broken off before they began to taper, so I insisted that he must once have had twenty-four. I explained to Antonia how this meant that he was twenty-four years old, that he must have been there when white men first came, left on from Buffalo in Indian times. As I turned him over, I began to feel proud of him, to have a kind of respect for his age and size. 
He seemed like the ancient eldest evil. Certainly, his kind have left horrible unconscious memories in all warm-blooded life. When we dragged him down into the draw, Dude sprang off to the end of his tether and shivered all over. Wouldn't let us come near him. We decided that Antonia should ride Dude home, and I would walk. As she rode slowly, her bare legs swinging against the pony's sides, she kept shouting back to me about how astonished everybody would be. I followed with a spade over my shoulder, dragging my snake. Her exaltation was contagious. The great land had never looked to me so big and free. If the red grass were full of rattlers, I was equal to them all. Nevertheless, I stole furtive glances behind me now and then to see that no avenging mate, older and bigger than my quarry, was racing up from the rear. The sun had set when we reached our garden and went down the draw toward the house. Otto Fuchs was the first one we met. He was sitting on the edge of the cattle pond, having a quiet pipe before supper. Antonia called him to come quick and look. He did not say anything for a minute, but scratched his head and turned the snake over with his boot. Where did you run into that beauty, Jim? Up at the dog town, I answered laconically. Kill him yourself? How come you to have a weapon? We'd been up to Russian Peters to borrow a spade for Ambrose. Otto shook the ashes out of his pipe and squatted down to the rattles. It was just luck you had a tool, he said cautiously. Gosh, I wouldn't want to do any business with that fellow myself unless I had a fence post along. Your grandmother snake came wouldn't more than tickle him. He could stand right up and talk to you, he could. Did he fight hard? Antonia broke in. He fights something awful. He's all over Jimmy's boots. I screamed for him to run, but he just hit and hit that snake like he was crazy. Otto winked at me. After Antonia rode on, he said, Got him in the head first, correct, didn't you? That was just as well. We hung him up on to the windmill, and when I went down to the kitchen, I found Antonia standing in the middle of the floor, telling the story with a great deal of color. Subsequent experiences with rattlesnakes taught me that my first encounter was fortunate in circumstance. My big rattler was old and had led too easy a life. There was not much fight in him. He had probably lived there for years with a fat prairie dog for breakfast whenever he felt like it, a sheltered home, even an owl feather bed perhaps, and he had forgot that the world does not owe rattlers a living. A snake of his size and fighting trim would be more than any boy could handle. So in reality, it was a mock adventure. The game was fixed for me by chance, as it probably was for many a dragon slayer. I had been adequately armed by Russian Peter. The snake was old and lazy, and I had Antonia beside me to appreciate and admire. That snake hung on our coral fence for several days. Some of the neighbors came to see it and agreed that it was the biggest rattler ever killed in those parts. This was enough for Antonia. She liked me better from that time on, and she never took a supercilious air with me again. I had killed a big snake. I was now a big fellow. Book One, Chapter Eight While the autumn color was growing pale on the grass and cornfields, things went badly with our friends the Russians. Peter told his troubles to Mr. Shimerda. He was unable to meet a note which fell due on the 1st of November had to pay an exorbitant bonus on renewing it, and to give a mortgage on his pigs and horses and even his milk cow. His creditor was Wick Cutter, the merciless Black Hawk moneylender, a man of evil name throughout the country, of whom I shall have more to say later. Peter could give no very clear account of his transactions with Cutter. He only knew that he had first borrowed two hundred dollars, then another hundred, then fifty, that each time a bonus was added to the principal, and the debt grew faster than any crop he planted. Now everything was plastered with mortgages. Soon after Peter renewed his note, Pavel strained himself lifting timbers for a new barn and fell over among the shavings with such a gush of blood from the lungs that his fellow workmen thought he would die on the spot. They hauled him home and put him into his bed, and there he lay, very ill indeed. 
Misfortune seemed to settle like an evil bird on the roof of the log house, and to flap its wings there, warning human beings away. The Russians had such bad luck that people were afraid of them and liked to put them out of mind. One afternoon, Antonia and her father came over to our house to get buttermilk and lingered, as they usually did, until the sun was low. Just as they were leaving, Russian Peter drove up. Pavel was very bad, he said, and wanted to talk to Mr. Shimerda and his daughter. He had come to fetch them. When Antonia and her father got into the wagon, I entreated Grandmother to let me go with them. I would gladly go without supper. I would sleep in the Shimerda's barn and run home in the morning. My plan must have seemed very foolish to her, but she was often large-minded about humoring the desires of other people. She asked Peter to wait a moment, and when she came back from the kitchen, she brought a bag of sandwiches and doughnuts for us. Mr. Shimerda and Peter were on the front seat. Antonia and I sat in the straw behind and ate our lunch as we bumped along. After the sun sank, a cold wind sprang up and moaned over the prairie. If this turn in the weather had come sooner, I should not have got away. We burrowed down in the straw and curled up close together, watching the angry red die out of the west and the stars begin to shine in the clear, windy sky. Peter kept sighing and groaning. Tony whispered to me that he was afraid Pavel would never get well. We lay still and did not talk. Up there the stars grew magnificently bright. Though we had come from such different parts of the world, in both of us there was some dusky superstition that those shining groups have their influence upon what is and what is not to be. Perhaps Russian Peter, come from farther away than any of us, had brought from his land too some such belief. The little house on the hillside was so much the color of the night that we could not see it as we came up the draw. The ruddy windows guided us, the light from the kitchen stove, for there was no lamp burning. We entered softly. The man in the wide bed seemed to be asleep. Tony and I sat down on the bench by the wall and leaned our arms on the table in front of us. The firelight flickered on the hewn logs that supported the thatch overhead. Pavel made a rasping sound when he breathed, and he kept moaning. We waited. The wind shook the doors and windows impatiently, then swept on again, singing through the big spaces. Each gust, as it bore down, rattled the panes and swelled off like the others. They made me think of defeated armies retreating, or of ghosts who were trying desperately to get in for shelter, and then went moaning on. Presently, in one of those sobbing intervals between the blasts, the coyotes tuned up with their whining howl, one, two, three, then all together, to tell us that winter was coming. This sound brought an answer from the bed, a long, complaining cry, as if Pavel were having bad dreams or were waking to some old misery. Peter listened, but did not stir. He was sitting on the floor by the kitchen stove. The coyotes broke out again. Yap, yap, yap then the high whine. Pavel called for something and struggled up on his elbow. He is scared of wolves, Antonia whispered to me. In his country there are very many, and they eat men and women. We slid closer together along the bench. I could not take my eyes off the man in the bed. His shirt was hanging open, and his emaciated chest, covered with yellow bristle, rose and fell horribly. He began to cough. Peter shuffled to his feet, caught up the tea kettle, and mixed him some hot water and whiskey. The sharp smell of spirits went through the room. Pavel snatched the cup and drank, then made Peter give him the bottle, and slipped it under his pillow, grinning disagreeably, as if he had outwitted someone. His eyes followed Peter about the room with a contemptuous, unfriendly expression. It seemed to me that he despised him for being so simple and docile. Presently, Pavel began to talk to Mr. Shimerda, scarcely above a whisper. He was telling a long story, and as he went on, Antonia took my hand under the table and held it tight. She leaned forward and strained her ears to hear him. He grew more and more excited and kept pointing all around his bed, as if there were things there and he wanted Mr. Shimerda to see them. "'It's wolves, Jimmy,' Antonia whispered. "'It's awful what he says.' The sick man raged and shook his fist. He seemed to be cursing people who had wronged him. Mr. Shimerda caught him by the shoulders, but could hardly hold him in bed. At last he was shut off by a coughing fit, which fairly choked him. 
He pulled a cloth from under his pillow and held it to his mouth. Quickly, it was covered with bright red spots. I thought I had never seen any blood so bright. When he lay down and turned his face to the wall, all the rage had gone out of him. He lay patiently fighting for breath, like a child with croup. Antonia's father uncovered one of his long, bony legs and rubbed it rhythmically. From our bench, we could see what a hollow case his body was. His spine and shoulder blades stood out like the bones under the hide of a dead steer left in the fields. That sharp backbone must have hurt him when he lay on it. Gradually, relief came to all of us. Whatever it was, the worst was over. Mr. Shimerda signed to us that Pavel was asleep. Without a word, Peter got up and lit his lantern. He was going out to give his team, get his team to drive us home. Mr. Shimerda went with him. We sat and watched the long bowed back under the blue sheet, scarcely daring to breathe. On the way home, when we were lying in the straw under the jolting and rattling, Antonia told me as much of the story as she could. What she did not tell me then, she told later. We talked of nothing else for days afterward. When Pavel and Peter were young men, living at home in Russia, they were asked to be groomsmen for a friend who was to marry the belle of another village. It was in the dead of winter, and the groom's party went over to the wedding in sledges. Peter and Pavel drove in the groom's sledge, and six sledges followed with all his relatives and friends. After the ceremony at the church, the party went to a dinner given by the parents of the bride. The dinner lasted all afternoon, then it became a supper and continued far into the night. There was much dancing and drinking. At midnight, the parents of the bride said goodbye to her and blessed her. The groom took her up in his arms and carried her out to a sledge and tucked her under the blankets. He sprang in beside her, and Pavel and Peter, our Pavel and Peter, took the front seat. Pavel drove. The party set out with singing and the jingle of sleigh bells, the groom's sledge going first. All the drivers were more or less the worse for merrymaking, and the groom was absorbed in his bride. The wolves were bad that winter, and everyone knew it, yet when they heard the first wolf cry, the drivers were not much alarmed. They had too much good food and drink inside them. The first howls were taken up and echoed, and with quickening repetitions. The wolves were coming together. There was no moon, but the starlight was clear on the snow. A black drove came up over the hill behind the wedding party. The wolves ran like streaks of shadow. They looked no bigger than dogs, but there were hundreds of them. Something happened to the hindmost sledge. The driver lost control. He was probably very drunk. The horses left the road. The sledge was caught up in a clump of trees and overturned. The occupants rolled out over the snow, and the fleetest of the wolves strang upon them. The shrieks that followed made everybody sober. The drivers stood up and lashed their horses. The groom had the best team, and his sledge was lightest. All the others carried from six to a dozen people. Another driver lost control. The screams of the horses were more terrible to hear than the cries of the men and women. Nothing seemed to check the wolves. It was hard to tell what was happening in the rear. The people who were falling behind shrieked as piteously as those who were already lost. The little bride hid her face on the groom's shoulder and sobbed. Pavel sat still and watched his horses. The road was clear and white, and the groom's three blacks went like the wind. It was only necessary to be calm and to guide them carefully. At length, as they breasted a long hill, Peter rose cautiously and looked back. There are only three sledges left, he whispered. And the wolves, Pavel asked. Enough. Enough for all of us. Pavel reached the brow of the hill, but only two sledges followed him down the other side. In that moment on the hilltop, they saw behind them a whirling black group on the snow. Presently the groom screamed. He saw his father's sledge overturned with his mother's and sister's. He sprang up as if he meant to jump, but the girl shrieked and held him back. It was even then too late. The black ground shadows were already crowding over the heap in the road, and one horse ran out across the fields, his harness hanging to him, wolves at his heels. But the groom's movement had given Pavel an idea. They were within a few miles of their village now. The only sledge left out of six was not very far behind them, and Pavel's middle horse was failing. Beside a frozen pond, something happened to the other sledge. Peter saw it plainly. 
Three big wolves got abreast of the horses, and the horses went crazy. They tried to jump over each other, got tangled up in the harness, and overturned the sledge. When the shrieking behind them died away, Pavel realized that he had, was alone upon the familiar road. They still come? he asked Peter. Yes. How many? Twenty? Thirty? Enough. Now his middle horse was being almost dragged by the other two. Pavel gave Peter the reins and stepped carefully into the back of the sledge. He called to the groom that they must lighten and pointed to the bride. The young man cursed him and held her tighter. Pavel tried to drag her away. In the struggle, the groom rose. Pavel knocked him over the side of the sledge and threw the girl after him. He said he never completely, he never remembered exactly how he did it or what happened afterward. Peter, crouching in the front seat, saw nothing. The first thing either of them noticed was a new sound that broke into the clean air, louder than they had ever heard it before, the bell of the monastery of their own village ringing for early prayers. Pavel and Peter drove into the village alone, and they had been alone ever since. They were run out of their village. Pavel's own mother would not look at him. They went away to strange towns, but when people learned where they came from, they were always asked if they knew the two men who had fed the bride to the wolves. Wherever they went, the story followed them. It took them five years to save money enough to come to America. They worked in Chicago, Des Moines, Fort Wayne, but they were always unfortunate. When Pavel's health grew so bad, they decided to try farming. Pavel died a few days after he unburdened his mind to Mr. Shimerda and was buried in the Norwegian graveyard. Peter sold off everything and left the country, went to be cook in a railway construction camp where gangs of Russians were employed. At his sale, we bought Peter's wheelbarrow and some of his harness. During the auction, he went about with his head down and never lifted his eyes. He seemed not to care about anything. The Black Hawk moneylender who held mortgages on Peter's livestock was there, and he bought in the sale notes at about 50 cents on the dollar. Everyone said Peter kissed the cow before she was led away by her new owner. I did not see him do it, but this I know. After all his furniture and his cook stove and pots and pans had been hauled off by the purchasers, when his house was stripped and bare, he sat down on the floor with his clasp knife and ate all the melons that he had put away for winter. When Mr. Shimerda and Krajek drove up in their wagon to take Peter to the train, they found him with a dripping beard, surrounded by heaps of melon rinds. The loss of his two friends had a depressing effect upon old Mr. Shimerda. When he was out hunting, he used to go into the empty log house and sit there, brooding. This cabin was his hermitage until the winter snows penned him in his cave. For Antonia and me, the story of the wedding party was never at an end. We did not tell Pavel's secret to anyone, but guarded it jealously. As if the wolves of the Ukraine had gathered that night long ago, and the wedding party had been sacrificed to give us a painful and peculiar pleasure. At night, before I went to sleep, I often found myself in a sledge drawn by three horses, dashing through a country that looks something like Nebraska and something like Virginia. Book 1, Chapter 9 The first snowfall came early in December. I remember how the world looked from our sitting room window as I dressed behind the stove that morning. The low sky was like a sheet of metal. The blonde cornfields had faded out into ghostliness at last. The little pond was frozen under its stiff willow bushes. Big white flakes were whirling over everything and disappearing in the red grass. Beyond the pond, on the slope that climbed to the cornfield, there was, faintly marked in the grass, a great circle where the Indians used to ride. Jake and Otto were sure that when they galloped round that ring, the Indians tortured prisoners, bound to a stake in the center. But Grandfather thought they merely ran races or trained horses there. Whenever one looked at this slope against the setting sun, the circle showed like a pattern in the grass, and this morning, when the first light spray of snow lay over it, it came out with wonderful distinctness, like strokes of Chinese white on canvas. The old figure stirred in me as it had never done before, and seemed a good omen for the winter. As soon as the snow had packed hard, 
I began to drive about the country in a clumsy sleigh that Otto Fuchs made for me by fastening a wooden goods box on Bob's. Fuchs had been apprenticed to a cabinet maker in the old country and was very handy with tools. He would have done a better job if I hadn't hurried him. My first trip was to the post office, and the next day I went over to take Yulka and Antonia for a sleigh ride. It was a bright cold day. I piled straw and buffalo robes into the box and took two hot bricks wrapped in old blankets. When I got to the Shimerdas, I did not go up to the house, but sat in my sleigh at the bottom of the draw and called. Antonia and Yulka came running out, wearing little rabbit skin hats their father had made for them. They had heard about my sledge from Ambrosch and knew why I had come. They tumbled in beside me, and we set off toward the north along a road that happened to be broken. The sky was brilliantly blue, and the sunlight on the glittering white stretches of prairie was almost blinding. As Antonia said, the whole world was changed by the snow. We kept looking in vain for familiar landmarks. The deep arroyo through which Squaw Creek wound was now only a cleft between snow drifts, very blue when one looked down into it. The treetops that had been gold all the autumn were dwarfed and twisted, as if they would never have any life in them again. The few little cedars, which were so dull and dingy before, now stood out a strong, dusky green. The wind had the burning taste of fresh snow. My throat and nostrils smarted as if someone had opened a heart-shorn bottle. The cold stung, and at the same time delighted one. My horse's breath rose like steam, and whenever we stopped he smoked all over. The cornfields got back a little of their color under the dazzling light, and stood the palest possible gold in the sun and snow. All about us the snow was crusted in shallow terraces, with tracings like ripple marks at the edges, curly waves that were the actual impression of the stinging lash in the wind. The girls had on cotton dresses under their shawls. They kept shivering beneath the buffalo robes and hugging each other for warmth. But they were so glad to get away from their ugly cave and their mother's scolding that they begged me to go on and on as far as Russian Peter's house. The great fresh open, after the stupefying warmth indoors, made them behave like wild things. They laughed and shouted and said they never wanted to go home again. Couldn't we settle down and live in Russian Peter's house? Yulka asked, and couldn't I go to town and buy things for us to keep house with? All the way to Russian Peter's we were extravagantly happy, but when we turned back, it must have been about four o'clock, the east wind grew stronger and began to howl, the sun lost its heartening power, and the sky became gray and somber. I took off my long woolen comforter and wound it around Yulka's throat. She got so cold that we made her hide her head under the buffalo robe. Antonia and I sat erect, but I held the reins clumsily, and my eyes were blinded by the wind a good deal of the time. It was growing dark when we got to their house, but I refused to go in with them and get warm. I knew my hands would ache terribly if I went near a fire. Yulka forgot to give me back my comforter, and I had to drive home directly against the wind. The next day I came down with an attack of quinsy, which kept me in the house for nearly two weeks. The basement kitchen seemed heavenly safe and warm in those days, like a tight little boat in a winter sea. The men were out in the fields all day, husking corn, and when they came in at noon, with long caps pulled down over their ears and their feet in red-lined overshoes, I used to think they were like Arctic explorers. In the afternoons, when Grandmother sat upstairs darning or making husking gloves, I read The Swiss Family Robinson aloud to her, and I felt that the Swiss family had no advantages over us in the way of an adventurous life. I was convinced that man's strongest antagonist is the cold. I admired the cheerful zest with which Grandmother went about keeping us warm and comfortable and well-fed. She often reminded me, when she was preparing for the return of the hungry men, that this country was not like Virginia, and that here a cook had, as she said, very little to do with. On Sunday she gave us as much chicken as we could eat, and on other days we had ham or bacon or sausage meat. She baked either pies or cake for us every day, unless, for a change, she made my favorite pudding, striped with currants and boiled in a bag. Next to getting warm and keeping warm, dinner and supper were the most interesting things we had to think about. 
Our lives centered around warmth and food and the return of the men at nightfall. I used to wonder, when they came in tired from the fields, their feet numb and their hands cracked and sore, how they could do all the chores so conscientiously, feed and water and bed the horses, milk the cows, and look after the pigs. When supper was over, it took them a long while to get the cold out of their bones. While Grandmother and I washed the dishes, and Grandfather read his paper upstairs, Jake and Otto sat on the long bench behind the stove, easing their inside boots, or rubbing mutton tallow into their cracked hands. Every Saturday night we popped corn or made taffy, and Otto Fuchs used to sing, For I am a cowboy and know I've done wrong, or Bury me not on the lone prairie. He had a good baritone voice, and always led the singing when we went to church services at the sod schoolhouse. I can still see those two men sitting on the bench, Otto's close-clipped head and Jake's shaggy hair slicked flat in front by a wet comb. I can see the sag of their tired shoulders against the whitewashed wall. What good fellows they were, how much they knew, and how many things they had kept faith with. Fuchs had been a cowboy, a stage driver, a bartender, a miner, had wandered all over that great western country and done hard work everywhere, though, as Grandmother said, he had nothing to show for it. Jake was duller than Otto, he could scarcely read, wrote even his name with difficulty, and he had a violent temper which sometimes made him behave like a crazy man, tore him all to pieces and actually made him ill but he was so soft-hearted that any one could impose upon him. If he, as he said, forgot himself and swore before Grandmother, he went about depressed and shamefaced all day. They were both of them jovial about the cold in winter and the heat in summer, and always ready to work overtime and to meet emergencies. It was a matter of pride with them not to spare themselves. Yet they were the sort of men who never get on somehow, or do anything but work hard for a dollar or two a day. On those bitter starlit nights, as we sat around the old stove that fed us and warmed us and kept us cheerful, we could hear the coyotes howling down by the corrals, and their hungry wintry cry used to remind the boys of wonderful animal stories, about gray wolves and bears in the Rockies, wild cats and panthers in the Virginia mountains. Sometimes Fuchs could be persuaded to talk about the outlaws and desperate characters he had known. I remember one funny story about himself that made Grandmother, who was working her bread on the breadboard, laugh until she wiped her eyes with her bare arm, her hands being floury. It was like this. When Otto left Austria to come to America, he was asked by one of his relatives to look after a woman who was crossing on the same boat, to join her husband in Chicago. The woman started off with two children, but it was clear that her family might grow larger on the journey. Fuchs said he got on fine with the kids, and liked the mother, though she played a sorry trick on him. In mid-ocean she proceeded to have not one baby, but three. This event made Fuchs the object of undeserved notoriety, since he was traveling with her. The steerage stewardess was indignant with him, the doctor regarded him with suspicion, the first cabin passengers, who made up a purse for the woman, took an embarrassing interest in Otto, and often inquired of him about his charge. When the triplets were taken ashore at New York, he had, as he said, to carry some of them. The trip to Chicago was even worse than the ocean voyage. On the train it was very difficult to get milk for the babies and to keep their bottles clean. The mother did her best, but no woman, out of her natural resources, could feed three babies. The husband, in Chicago, was working in a furniture factory for modest wages, and when he met his family at the station he was rather crushed by the size of it, he, too, seemed to consider Fuchs in some fashion to blame. I was sure glad, Otto concluded, that he didn't take his hard feelings out on that poor woman, but he had a sullen eye for me all right. Now, did you ever hear of a young feller's having such hard luck, Mrs. Burden? Grandmother told him she was sure the Lord had remembered these things to his credit, and had helped him out of many a scrape when he didn't realize that he was being protected by Providence. Book One, The Shimardas, Chapter Ten for several weeks after my sleigh ride, we heard nothing from the Shimardas. My sore throat kept me indoors, and Grandmother had a cold which made the housework heavy for her. When Sunday came, she was glad to have a day of rest. One night at supper, Fuchs told us he had seen Mr. Shimarda out hunting. 
He's made himself a rabbit skin cap, Jim, and a rabbit skin collar that he buttons on outside his coat. They ain't got but one overcoat among em over there, and they take turns wearing it. They seem awful scared of cold and stick in that hole in the bank like badgers. All but the crazy boy Jake put in. He never wears the coat. Cryak says he's terrible strong and can stand anything. I guess rabbits must be getting scarce in this locality. Ambrose come along by the cornfield yesterday where I was at work. It showed me three prairie dogs he'd shot. He asked me if they was good to eat. I spit and made a face and took on to scare him, but he just looked like he was smarter than me and put him back in his sack and walked off. Grandmother looked up in alarm and spoke to Grandfather. Josiah, you don't suppose Cryak would let the poor creatures eat prairie dogs, do you? "'You'd better go over and see our neighbors tomorrow, Emmeline,' he replied gravely. Fuchs put in a cheerful word and said prairie dogs were clean beasts and ought to be good for food, but their family connections were against them. I asked what he meant, and he grinned and said they belonged to the rat family. When I went downstairs in the morning, I found Grandmother and Jake packing a hamp hamper basket in the kitchen. "'Now, Jake,' Grandmother was saying, "'if you can find that old rooster that got his comb froze, just give his neck a twist and we'll take him along.' There was no good reason why Mrs. Shimada couldn't have gotten hands from her neighbors last fall and had a hen house going by now. I reckon she was confused and didn't know where to begin. I've come strange to a new country myself, but I never forgot hens are a good thing to have, no matter what you don't have. Just as you say, ma'am, said Jake, but I hate to think of Cryat getting a leg of that old rooster. He tramped out through the long cellar and dropped the heavy door behind him. After breakfast, Grandmother and Jake and I bundled ourselves up, and climbed into the cold front wagon seat. As we approached the Shimardas, we heard the frosty whine of the pump, and saw Antonia, her head tied up and her cotton dress blown about her, throwing all her weight on the pump handle as it went up and down. She heard our wagon look back over her shoulder, and, catching up her pail of water, started at a run for the hole in the bank. Jake held grand Grandmother to the ground, saying he would bring the provisions after he had blanketed his horses. We went slowly up the icy path toward the door, sunk in the draw side. Blue puffs of smoke came from the stovepipe that stuck out through the grass and snow, but the wind whisked them roughly away. Mrs. Shimarda opened the door before we knocked and seized Grandmother's hand. She did not say, How do, as usual, but at once began to cry, talking very fast in her own language, pointing to her feet, which were tied up in rags, and looking about accusingly at everyone. The old man was sitting on a stump behind the stove, crouching over as if he were trying to hide from us. Yulka was on the floor at his feet, her kitten in her lap. She peeped out at me and smiled, but glancing up at her mother, hid again. Antonia was washing pans and dishes in a dark corner. The crazy boy lay under the only window, stretched out on a gunny sack stuffed with straw. As soon as we entered, he threw a grain sack over the crack at the bottom of the door. The air in the cave was stifling, and it was very dark, too. A lighted lantern hung over the stove, threw out a feeble yellow glimmer. Mrs. Shimarda snatched off the covers of two barrels behind the door and made us look into them. In one there were some potatoes that had been frozen and were rotting. In the other was a little pile of flour. Grandmother murmured something in embarrassment, but the bohemian woman laughed scornfully, a kind of whinny laugh, and catching up an empty coffee pot from the shelf, shook it at us with a look positively vindictive. Grandmother went on talking in her polite Virginia way, not admitting their stark need or her own remissness, until Jake arrived with a hamper, as if in direct answer to Mrs. Shimerda's reproaches. Then the poor woman broke down. She dropped on the floor beside her crazy son, hid her face on her knees, and sat crying bitterly. Grandmother paid no heed to her, but called Antonia to come and help empty the basket. Tony left her corner reluctantly. I had never seen her crushed like this before. "'You not mind my poor mamenka, Mrs. Burden?' She is so sad, she whispered, as she wiped her wet hands on her skirt and took the things Grandmother handed her. The crazy boy, seeing the food, began to make soft, gurgling noises and stroked his stomach. Jake came in again, this time with a sack of potatoes. Grandmother looked about in perplexity. Haven't you got any sort of cave or cellar outside, Antonia? This is no place to keep vegetables. How did your potatoes get frozen? We get from Mr. Bushy at the post office what he throw out. We got no potatoes, Mrs. Burden, Tony admitted mournfully. When Jake went out, Merrick crawled along the floor and stuffed up the door crack again. Then, quietly as a shadow, Mr. Shimarda came out from behind the stove. He stood brushing his hand over his smooth gray hair as if he were trying to clear away a fog about his head. He was clean and neat as usual with his green neckcloth and his coral pin. 
He took grandmother's arm and led her behind the stove to the back of the room. In the rear wall was another little cave, a round hole not much bigger than an oil barrel scooped out in the black earth. When I got up on one of the stools and peered into it, I saw some quilts and a pile of straw. The old man held the lantern. Yulka, he said in a low, despairing voice. Yulka, my Antonia. Grandmother drew back. You mean they sleep in there, your girls? He bowed his head. Tony slipped under his arm. It is very cold on the floor, and this is warm like the badger hole. I like for sleep there, she insisted eagerly. My mamenka have nice bed with pillows from our own geese in Bohemi. See, Jim? She pointed to the narrow bunk which Krayak had built against the wall for himself before the Shimurdas came. Grandmother sighed. Sure enough, where would you sleep, dear? I don't doubt you're warm there. You'll have a better house after a while, Antonia, and then you will forget these hard times. Mr. Shimurda made grandmother sit down on the only chair and pointed his wife to a stool beside her. Standing before them with his hand on Antonia's shoulder, he talked in a low tone, and his daughter translated. He wanted us to know that they were not beggars in the old country. He made good wages, and his family were respected there. He left Bohemia with more than a thousand dollars in savings after their passage money was paid. He had in some way lost on exchange in New York, and the railway fare to Nebraska was more than they had expected. By the time they paid Cryak for the land and bought his horses and oxen, and some old farm machinery, they had very little money left. He wished Grandmother to know, however, that he still had some money. If they could get through until spring came, they would buy a cow and chickens and plant a garden, and they would then do very well. Ambrose and Antonia were both old enough to work in the fields, and they were willing to work, but the snow and the bitter weather had disheartened them all. Antonia explained that her father meant to build a new house for them in the spring. He and Ambrose had already split the logs for it, but the logs were all buried in the snow along the creek where they had been felled. While Grandmother encouraged and gave them advice, I sat down on the floor with Yulka and let her show me her kitten. Varick slid cautiously toward us and began to exhibit his webbed fingers. I knew he wanted to make his queer noises for me, to bark like a dog or whinny like a horse, but he did not dare in the presence of his elders. Merrick was always trying to be agreeable, poor fellow, as if he had it on his mind that he must make up for his deficiencies. Mrs. Shimada grew more calm and reasonable before our visit was over, and, while Antonia translated, put in a word now and then on her own account. The woman had a quick ear and caught up phrases whenever she heard English spoken. As we rose to go, she opened her wooden chest and brought out a bag made of bed-ticking, about as long as a flour sack and half as wide, stuffed full of something. At sight of it, the crazy boy began to smack his lips. When Mrs. Shimarda opened the bag and stirred the contents with her hand, it gave out a salty, earthy smell, very pungent even among the other odors of that cave. She measured a teacup full, tied it up in a bit of sacking, and presented it ceremoniously to Grandmother. For cook, she announced, little now be very much when cook, spreading out her hands as if to indicate that the pint would swell to a gallon. Very good. You no have in this country. All things for eat better in my country. Maybe so, Mrs. Shimerda, Grandmother said dryly. I can't say, but I prefer our bread to yours myself. Antonia undertook to explain. This very good, Mrs. Burden. She clasped her hands as if she could not express how good. It make very much when you cook. Like what my mamma say. Cook with rabbit, cook with chicken, in the gravy. Oh, so good. All the way home, Grandmother and Jake talked about how easily good Christian people could forget they were their brother's keepers. I will say, Jake, some of our brothers and sisters are hard to keep. Where is a body to begin with these people? They are wanting in everything, and most of all in horse sense. Nobody can give them that, I guess. Jimmy here is about as able to take over a homestead as they are. Do you reckon that boy Ambrose has any real push in him? He's a worker, all right, ma'am, and he's got some catch on about him. But he's a mean one. Folks can be mean enough to get on in this world, and then again they can be too mean. That night, while Grandmother was getting supper, we opened the package Mrs. Shimarda had given her. It was full of little brown chips that looked like the shavings of some root. They were as light as feathers, and the most noticeable thing about them was their penetrating earthy odor. We could not determine whether they were animal or vegetable. They might be dried meat from some queer beast, Jim. They ain't dried fish, and they never grew on stock or vine. I'm afraid of him. Anyhow, I shouldn't want to eat anything that had been shut up for months with old clothes and goose pillows. 
She threw the package into the stove, but I bit off a corner of one of the chips I held in my hand and chewed it tentatively. I never forgot the strange taste, though it was many years before I knew that those little brown shavings which the Shimerdas had brought so far and treasured so jealously were dried mushrooms. They had been gathered, probably in some deep bohemian forest. Book One, The Shimerdas, Chapter Eleven during the week before Christmas, Jake was the most important person of our household, for he was to go to town and do all our Christmas shopping. But on the 21st of December the snow began to fall. The flakes came down so thickly that from the sitting-room windows I could not see beyond the windmill. Its frame looked dim and gray, unsubstantial like a shadow. The snow did not stop falling all day or during the night that followed, the cold was not severe, but the storm was quiet and resistless. The men could not go farther than the barns and corral. They sat about the house most of the day, as if it were Sunday, greasing their boots, mending their suspenders, plaiting whiplashes. On the morning of the 22nd, Grandfather announced at breakfast that it would be impossible to go to Black Hawk for Christmas purchases. Jake was sure he could get through on horseback and bring home our things in saddlebags, but Grandfather told him the roads would be obliterated, and a newcomer in the country would be lost ten times over. Anyway, he would never allow one of his horses to be put to such a strain. We decided to have a country Christmas without any help from town. I had wanted to get some picture books for Yulka and Antonia. Even Yulka was able to read a little now. Grandmother took me into the ice-cold storeroom, where she had some bolts of gingham and sheeting. She cut squares of cotton cloth, and we sewed them together into a book. We bound it between pasteboards, which I covered with brilliant calico, representing scenes from a circus. For two days I sat at the dining-room table, pasting this book full of pictures for Yulka. We had files of those good old family magazines, which used to publish colored lithographs of popular paintings, and I was allowed to use some of these. I took Napoleon announcing the divorce to Josephine for my frontispiece. On the white pages I grouped Sunday school cards and advertising cards, which I had brought from my old country. Fuchs got out the old candle molds and made tallow candles. Grandmother hunted up her fancy cake cutters and baked gingerbread men and roosters, which we decorated with burnt sugar and red cinnamon drops. On the day before Christmas, Jake packed the things we were sending to the Shimerdas in his saddlebags and set off on Grandfather's gray gelding. When he mounted his horse at the door, I saw that he had a hatchet slung to his belt, and he gave Grandmother a meaning look, which told me he was planning a surprise for me. That afternoon I watched long and eagerly from the sitting-room window. At last I saw a dark spot moving on the west hill beside the half-buried cornfield where the sky was taking on a coppery flush from the sun that did not quite break through. I put on my cap and ran out to meet Jake. When I got to the pond I could see that he was bringing in a little cedar tree across his pommel. He used to help my father cut Christmas trees for me in Virginia and he had not forgotten how much I liked them. By the time we had placed the cold, fresh-smelling little tree in a corner of the sitting-room, it was already Christmas Eve. After supper we all gathered there, and even Grandfather, reading his paper by the table, looked up with friendly interest now and then. The cedar was about five feet high and very shapely. We hung it with gingerbread animals, strings of popcorn, and bits of candle which Fuchs had fitted into pasteboard sockets. Its real splendors, however, came from the most unlikely place in the world, from Otto's cowboy trunk. I had never seen anything in that trunk but old boots and spurs and pistols, and a fascinating mixture of yellow leather tongs, cartridges, and shoemaker's wax. From under the lining he now produced a collection of brilliantly colored paper figures, several inches high, and stiff enough to stand alone. They had been sent to him year after year by his old mother in Austria. There was a bleeding heart in tufts of paper lace. There were three kings gorgeously apparelled, and the ox and the ass and the shepherds. There was the baby in the manger, and a group of angels singing. There were camels and leopards held back by the black slaves of the three kings. 
Our tree became the talking tree of the fairy tale. Legends and stories nestled like birds in its branches. Grandmother said it reminded her of the tree of knowledge. We put sheets of cotton wool under it for a snow field, and Jake's pocket mirror for a frozen lake. I can see them now, exactly as they looked, working about the table in the lamplight. Jake with his heavy features so rudely molded that his face seemed somehow unfinished. Otto with his half-ear and the savage scar that made his upper lip curl so ferociously under his twisted mustache. As I remember them, what unprotected faces they were, their very roughness and violence made them defenseless. These boys had no practiced manner behind which they could retreat and hold people at a distance. They had only their hard fists to batter at the world with. Otto was already one of those drifting, case-hardened laborers who never marry or have children of their own, yet he was so fond of children. Book One, The Shimurdas, Chapter Twelve On Christmas morning, when I got down to the kitchen, the men were just coming in from their chores. The horses and pigs always had their breakfast before we did. Jake and Otto shouted Merry Christmas to me, and winked at each other when they saw the waffle irons on the stove. Grandfather came down wearing a white shirt and his Sunday coat. Morning prayers were longer than usual. He read the chapters from St. Matthew about the birth of Christ, and as we listened it all seemed like something that had happened lately and near at hand. In his prayer he thanked the Lord for the first Christmas, and for all that it had meant to the world ever since. He gave thanks for our food and comfort, and prayed for the poor and destitute in great cities where the struggle for life was harder than it was here with us. Grandfather's prayers were often very interesting. He had the gift of simple and moving expression. Because he talked so little, his words had a peculiar force. They were not worn dull from constant use. His prayers reflected what he was thinking about at the time, and it was chiefly through them that we got to know his feelings and his views about things. After we sat down to our waffles and sausage, Jake told us how pleased the Shimurdas had been with their presents. Even Ambrose was friendly, and went to the creek with him to cut the Christmas tree. It was a soft gray day outside, with heavy clouds working across the sky, and occasional squalls of snow. There were always odd jobs to be done about the barn on holidays, and the men were busy until afternoon. Then Jake and I played dominoes, while Otto wrote a long letter home to his mother. He always wrote to her on Christmas Day, he said, no matter where he was, and no matter how long it had been since his last letter. All afternoon he sat in the dining room. He would write for a while, then sit idle, his clenched fist lying on the table, his eyes following the pattern of the oilcloth. He spoke and wrote his own language so seldom that it came to him awkwardly. His effort to remember entirely absorbed him. At about four o'clock a visitor appeared. Mr. Shimurda, wearing his rabbit-skin cap and collar, and new mittens his wife had knitted. He had come to thank us for the presents, and for all grandmother's kindness to his family. Jake and Otto joined us from the basement, and we sat about the stove, enjoying the deepening gray of the winter afternoon, and the atmosphere of comfort and security in my grandfather's house. This feeling seemed completely to take possession of Mr. Shimurda. I suppose, in the crowded clutter of their cave, the old man had come to believe that peace and order had vanished from the earth, or existed only in the old world he had left so far behind. He sat still and passive, his head resting against the back of the wooden rocking chair, his hands relaxed upon the arms. His face had a look of weariness and pleasure, like that of sick people when they feel relief from pain. Grandmother insisted on his drinking a glass of Virginia apple brandy after his long walk in the cold, and when a faint flush came up in his cheeks, his features might have been cut out of a shell, they were so transparent. He said almost nothing and smiled rarely, but as he rested there we all had a sense of his utter content. As it grew dark, I asked whether I might light the Christmas tree before the lamp was brought. When the candle-ends sent up their conical yellow flames, 
all the colored figures from Austria, stood out clear and full of meaning against the green boughs. Mr. Shimerda rose, crossed himself, and quietly knelt down before the tree, his head sunk forward. His long body formed a letter S. I saw Grandmother look apprehensively at Grandfather. He was rather narrow in religious matters, and sometimes spoke out and hurt people's feelings. There had been nothing strange about the tree before, but now with someone kneeling before it, images, candles. Grandfather merely put his fingertips to his brow and bowed his venerable head, thus protestantizing the atmosphere. We persuaded our guest to stay for supper with us. He needed a little urging. As we sat down to the table it occurred to me that he liked to look at us and that our faces were open books to him. When his deep seeing eyes rested on me, I felt as if he were looking far ahead into the future for me, down the road I would have to travel. At nine o'clock Mr. Shimerda lighted one of our lanterns and put on his overcoat and fur collar. He stood in the little entry hall, the lantern and his fur cap under his arm, shaking hands with us. When he took Grandmother's hand, he bent over it as he always did and said slowly, Good woman. He made the sign of the cross over me, put on his cap, and went off in the dark. As we turned back to the sitting room, Grandfather looked at me searchingly. The prayers of all good people are good, he said quietly. Book One, The Shimerdas, Chapter Thirteen The week following Christmas brought in a thaw, and by New Year's Day all the world about us was a broth of gray slush, and the guttered slope between the windmill and the barn was running black water. The soft black earth stood out in patches along the roadsides. I resumed all my chores, carried in the cobs and wood and water, and spent the afternoons at the barn, watching Jake shell corn with a hand-sheller. One morning during this interval of fine weather, Antonia and her mother rode over on one of their shaggy old horses to pay us a visit. It was the first time Mrs. Shimerda had been to our house, and she ran about, examining our carpets and curtains and furniture, all the while commenting upon them to her daughter in an envious, complaining tone. In the kitchen she caught up an iron pot that stood on the back of the stove and said, "'You got many. Shimerda's no got.' I thought it weak-minded of Grandmother to give the pot to her. After dinner, when she was helping to wash the dishes, she said, tossing her head, "'You got many things for cook. If I got all things like you I make much better.' She was a conceited, boastful old thing, and even misfortune could not humble her. I was so annoyed that I felt coldly even toward Antonia, and listened unsympathetically when she told me her father was not well. My papa sad for the old country. He not look good. He never make music any more. At home he play violin all the time, for weddings and for dance. Here, never. When I beg him for play, he shake his head no. Some days he take his violin out of his box and make with his fingers on the strings like this, but never he make the music. He don't like this country. People who don't like this country ought to stay home, I said severely. We don't make them come here. He not want to come. Never, she burst out. My mamenka made him come. All the time she say, America big country, much money, much land for my boys, much husband for my girls. My papa, he cry for leave his old friends what make music with him. He love very much the man what play the longhorn, like this. She indicated a slide trombone. They go to school together and are friends from boys. But my mamma, she want Ambrose for be rich with many cattle. Your mamma, I said angrily, wants other people's things. Your grandfather is rich, she retorted fiercely. Why he not help my papa? Ambrose be rich too after a while, and he pay back. He is a very smart boy. For Ambrose, my mamma come here. Ambrose was considered the important person in the family. Mrs. Shimerda and Antonia always deferred to him, though he was often surly with them and contemptuous toward his father. Ambrose and his mother had everything their own way. Though Antonia loved her father more than she did anyone else, she stood in awe of her elder brother. After I watched Antonia and her mother go over the hill on their miserable horse, carrying our iron pot with them, I turned to Grandmother, who had taken up her darning, and said I hoped that snooping old woman wouldn't come to see us any more. 
Grandmother chuckled and drove her bright needle across a hole in Otto's sock. She's not old, Jim, though I expect she seems old to you. No, I wouldn't warn if she never came again. But you see, a body never knows what traits poverty might bring out in him. It makes a woman grasping to see her children want for things. Now read me a chapter in The Prince of the House of David. Let's forget the Bohemians. We had three weeks of this mild open weather. The cattle in the corral ate corn almost as fast as the men could shell it for them, and we hoped they would be ready for an early market. One morning the two big bulls, Gladstone and Brigham Young, thought spring had come, and they began to tease and butt at each other across the barbed wire that separated them. Soon they got angry. They bellowed and pawed up the soft earth with their hoofs, rolling their eyes and tossing their heads. Each withdrew to a far corner of his own corral, and then they made for each other at a gallop. Thud, thud! We could hear the impact of their great heads, and their bellowing shook the pans on the kitchen shelves. Had they not been dehorned, they would have torn each other to pieces. Pretty soon the fat steers took it up and began butting and horning each other. Clearly the affair had to be stopped. We all stood by and watched admiringly, as Fuchs rode into the corral with the pitchfork and prodded the bulls again and again, finally driving them apart. The big storm of the winter began on my eleventh birthday, the twentieth of January. When I went down to breakfast that morning, Jake and Otto came in white as snowmen, beating their hands and stamping their feet. They began to laugh boisterously when they saw me, calling, "'You've got a birthday present this time, Jim, and no mistake. They was a full-grown blizzard ordered for you.' All day the storm went on. The snow did not fall this time. It simply spilled out of heaven, like thousands of feather beds being emptied. The afternoon kitchen was a carpenter shop. The men brought in their tools and made two great wooden shovels with long handles. Neither grandmother nor I could go out in the storm, so Jake fed the chickens and brought in a pitiful contribution of eggs. Next day our men had to shovel until noon to reach the barn, and the snow was still falling. There had not been such a storm in the ten years my grandfather had lived in Nebraska. He said at dinner that we would not try to reach the cattle. They were fat enough to go without their corn for a day or two. But tomorrow we must feed them and thaw out their water tap so they could drink. We could not so much as see the corrals, but we knew the steers were over there, huddled together under the north bank. Our ferocious bulls, subdued enough by this time, were probably warming each other's backs. "'This'll take the bile out of them, Fuchs remarked gleefully. At noon that day the hens had not been heard from. After dinner, Jake and Otto, their damp clothes now dried on them, stretched their stiff arms and plunged again into the drifts. They made a tunnel under the snow to the hen-house with walls so solid that Grandmother and I could walk back and forth in it. We found the chickens asleep. Perhaps they thought night had come to stay. One old rooster was stirring about, pecking at the solid lump of ice in their water-tin. When we flashed the lantern in their eyes, the hens set up a great cackling and flew about clumsily, scattering down feathers. The mottled, pin-headed guinea-hens, always resentful of captivity, ran screeching out into the tunnel and poked their ugly painted faces through the snow walls. By five o'clock the chores were done, just when it was time to begin them all over again. That was a strange, unnatural sort of day. Book One, Chapter Fourteen The Shimerdas On the morning of the twenty-second I wakened with a start. Before I opened my eyes I seemed to know that something had happened. I heard excited voices in the kitchen. Grandmother's was so shrill that I knew she must be almost beside herself. I looked forward to any new crisis with delight. What could it be, I wondered, as I hurried into my clothes? Perhaps the barn had burned. Perhaps the cattle had frozen to death. Perhaps a neighbor was lost in the storm. Down in the kitchen, Grandfather was standing before the stove with his hands behind him. Jake and Otto had taken off their boots and were rubbing their woolen socks. Their clothes and boots were steaming, and they both looked exhausted. On the bench behind the stove lay a man, covered up with a blanket. Grandmother motioned me to the dining room. I obeyed reluctantly. I watched as she came in, went, carrying dishes. Her lips were tightly compressed, and she kept whispering to herself, O oh, dear Saviour, Lord, thou knowest. Presently, Grandfather came in and spoke to me. Jimmy, 
We will not have prayers this morning because we have a great deal to do. Old Mr. Shimurda is dead, and his family are in great distress. Ambrosch came over here in the middle of the night, and Jake and Otto went back with him. The boys have had a hard night, and you must not bother them with questions. That is Ambrosch asleep on the bench. Come in to breakfast, boys. After Jake and Otto had swallowed their first cup of coffee, they began to talk excitedly, disregarding grandmother's warning glances. I held my tongue, but I listened with all my ears. No, sir, Fuchs said in answer to a question from grandfather. Nobody heard the gun go off. Ambrosch was out with the oxen team, trying to break a road, and the women folks was shut up tight in their cave. When Ambrosch came in, it was dark and he didn't see nothing, but the oxen acted kind of queer. One of them ripped around and got away from him, bolted clean out of the stable. His hands is blistered where the rope run through. He got a lantern and went back and found the old man, just as we seen him. Poor soul, poor soul, grandmother groaned. I'd like to think he never done it. He was always considerate and unwishful to give trouble. How could he forget himself and bring this on us? I don't think he was out of his head for a minute, Mrs. Burden, folks declared. He done everything natural. You know he was always sort of fixy, and fixy he was to the last. He shaved after dinner, and washed himself all over, after the girls was done the dishes. Antonia heated the water for him. Then he put on a clean shirt and clean socks, and after he was dressed he kissed her and the little one, and took his gun and said he was going out to hunt rabbits. He must have gone right down to the barn and done it then. He laid down on that bunk bed, close to the ox stalls where he always slept. When we found him, everything was decent except... Fuchs wrinkled his brow and hesitated. Except what he couldn't nowise foresee. His coat was hung on a peg, and his boots was under the bed. He would took off that silk neckcloth he always wore, and folded it smooth and stuck his pin through it. He turned back his shirt at the neck and rolled up his sleeves. "'I don't see how he could do it,' Grandmother kept saying. Otto misunderstood her. "'Why, ma'am, it was simple enough. He pulled the trigger with his big toe. He laid over on his side and put the end of the barrel in his mouth. Then he drew up one foot and felt for the trigger. He found it all right. "'Maybe he did,' said Jake grimly. "'There's something mighty queer about it. "'Now what do you mean, Jake?' Grandmother asked sharply. "'Well, ma'am, I found Cratchit's axe under the manger, "'and I picks it up and carries it over to the corpse, "'and I take my oath. "'It just fit the gash in the front of the old man's face. "'That there Cratchit had been sneaking around, "'pale and quiet, and when he seen me examining the axe, "'he'd begun whimpering. "'My God, man, don't do that. "'I reckon I'm a-goin' to look into this,' says I. "'Then he begun to squeal like a rat, "'and rung around wringing his hands.' "'They'll hang me,' says he. "'My God, they'll hang me, sure.' Fuchs spoke up impatiently. cragic has gone silly, Jake, and so have you. "'The old man wouldn't have made all them preparations for Krajic to murder him, would he? "'It don't hang together. "'The gun was right beside him when Ambrose found him. "'Krajic could have put it there, couldn't he?' Jake demanded. "'Grandmother broke in excitedly. "'See here, Jake Marpole, don't you go trying to add murder to suicide.' We're deep enough in trouble. Otto reads you too many of them detective stories. It will be easy to decide all that, Emmeline said grandfather quietly. If he shot himself in the way they think, the gash will be torn from the inside outward. Just so it is, Mr. Burden, Otto affirmed. I seen bunches of hair and stuff sticking to the poles and straw along the roof. They was blown up there by gunshot, no question. Grandmother told Grandfather she meant to go over to the Shimmerdust with him. "'There is nothing you can do,' he said doubtfully. "'The body can't be touched until we get the coroner here from Black Hawk, and that will be a matter of several days this weather.' "'Well, I can take them some victuals anyway, and say a word of comfort to them poor little girls.' The oldest one was his darling, and was like a right hand to him. He might have thought of her. He's left her alone in a hard world.' She glanced distrustfully at Ambrosch, who was now eating his breakfast at the kitchen table. Fuchs, although he had been up in the cold nearly all night, was going to make the long ride to Blackhawk to fetch the priest and the coroner. 
On the grey gelding, our best horse, he would try to pick his way across the country, with no roads to guide him. "'Don't you worry about me, Mrs. Burden,' he said cheerfully, as he put on a second pair of socks. "'I've got a good nose for directions, and I never did need much sleep. It's the grey I'm worried about. I'll save him what I can, but it'll strain him, as sure as I'm telling you. This is no time to be over-considerate of animals, Otto. Do the best you can for yourself. Stop at the widow Stevens for dinner. She's a good woman, and she'll do well by you. After Fuchs rode away, I was left with Ambrosch. I saw a side of him I had not seen before. He was deeply, even slavishly devout. He did not say a word all morning, but sat with his rosary in his hands, praying, now silently, now aloud. He never looked away from his beads, nor lifted his hands except to cross himself. Several times the poor boy fell asleep where he sat, wakened with a start, and began to pray again. No wagon could be got to the Shimmerdesses until a road was broken, and that would be a day's job. Grandfather came from the barn on one of our big black horses, and Jake lifted Grandmother up behind him. She wore her black hood and was bundled up in shawls. Grandfather tucked his bushy white beard inside his overcoat. They looked very biblical as they set off, I thought. Jake and Ambrosch followed them, riding the other black and my pony, carrying bundles of clothes that we had got together for Mrs. Shimerda. I watched them go past the pond and over the hill by the drifted cornfield. Then for the first time I realized that I was alone in the house. I felt a considerable extension of power and authority, and was anxious to acquit myself creditably. I carried in cobs and wood from the long cellar, and filled both the stoves. I remembered that in the hurry and excitement of the morning nobody had thought of the chickens, and the eggs had not been gathered. Going out through the tunnel, I gave the hens their corn, emptied the ice from their drinking pan, and filled it with water. After the cat had had his milk, I could think of nothing else to do, and I sat down to get warm. The quiet was delightful, and the ticking clock was the most pleasant of companions. I got Robinson Crusoe and tried to read, but his life on the island seemed dull compared with ours. Presently, as I looked with satisfaction about our comfortable sitting-room, it flashed upon me that if Mr. Shimerda's soul were lingering about in this world at all, it would be here in our house, which had been more to his liking than any other in the neighborhood. I remembered his contented face when he was with us on Christmas Day. If he could have lived with us, this terrible thing would never have happened. I knew it was homesickness that had killed Mr. Shimerda, and I wondered whether his released spirit would not eventually find its way back to his own country. I thought of how far it was to Chicago, and then to Virginia, to Baltimore, and then the great wintry ocean. No. He would not at once set out upon that long journey. Surely his exhausted spirit, so tired of cold and crowding, and the struggle with the ever-falling snow, was resting now in this quiet house. I was not frightened, but I made no noise. I did not wish to disturb him. I went softly down to the kitchen, which tucked away so snugly underground, always seemed to me the heart and center of the house. There on the bench, behind the stove, I thought and thought about Mr. Shimerda. Outside I could hear the wind singing over hundreds of miles of snow. It was as if I had let the old man in out of the tormenting winter, and were sitting there with him. I went over all that Antonia had ever told me about his life before he came to this country, how he used to play the fiddle at weddings and dances. I thought about the friends he had mourned to leave, the trombone player, the great forest full of game, belonging, as Antonia said, to the nobles, from which she and her mother used to steal wood on moonlight nights. There was a white heart that lived in that forest, and if anyone killed it he would be hanged, she said. Such vivid pictures came to me that they might have been Mr. Shimerda's memories, not yet faded out from the air in which they had haunted him. It had begun to grow dark when my household returned, and Grandmother was so tired that she went at once to bed. Jake and I got supper, and while we were washing the dishes he told me in loud whispers about the state of things at the Shimerdas. Nobody could touch the body 
until the coroner came. If any one did, something terrible would happen, apparently. The dead man was frozen through, just as stiff as a dressed turkey you hang out to freeze, Jake said. The horses and oxen would not go into the barn until he was frozen so hard that there was no longer any smell of blood. They were stabled there now, with the dead men, because there was no other place to keep them. A lighted lantern was kept hanging over Mr. Shimerda's head. Antonia and Ambrosch and the mother took turns going down to pray beside him. The crazy boy went with them, because he did not feel the cold. I believed he felt cold as much as anyone else, but he liked to be thought insensible to it. He was always coveting distinction. Poor Marek! Ambrosch, Jake said, showed more human feeling than he would have supposed him capable of, but he was chiefly concerned about getting a priest, and about his father's soul, which he believed was in a place of torment, and would remain there until his family and the priest had prayed a great deal for him. As I understand it, Jake concluded, it will be a matter of years to pray his soul out of purgatory, and right now he's in torment. I don't believe it, I said stoutly. I almost know it ain't true. I did not, of course, say that I believed he had been in that very kitchen all afternoon, on his way back to his own country. Nevertheless, after I went to bed, this idea of punishment and purgatory came back on me crushingly. I remembered the account of dives and torment and shuddered. But Mr. Shimerda had not been rich and selfish. He had only been so unhappy that he could not live any longer. Book One the Shimerdas, Chapter 15 Otto Fuchs got back from Black Hawk at noon the next day. He reported that the coroner would reach the Shimerdas some time that afternoon, but the missionary priest was at the other end of his parish, a hundred miles away, and the trains were not running. Fuchs had got a few hours' sleep at the livery barn in town, but he was afraid the gray gelding had strained himself. Indeed, he was never the same horse afterward. That long trip through the deep snow had taken all the endurance out of him. Fuchs brought home with him a stranger, a young bohemian who had taken a homestead near Black Hawk, and who came on his only horse to help his fellow countrymen in their trouble. That was the first time I ever saw Anton Jelinek. He was a strapping young fellow in the early twenties then, handsome, warm-hearted, and full of life, and he came to us like a miracle in the midst of that grim business. I remember exactly how he strode into our kitchen in his felt boots and long wolfskin coat, his eyes and cheeks bright with the cold. At sight of grandmother, he snatched off his fur cap, greeting her in a deep, rolling voice which seemed older than he. I want to thank you very much, Mrs. Burden, for that you are so kind to poor strangers from my country. He did not hesitate like a farmer boy, but looked one eagerly in the eye when he spoke. Everything about him was warm and spontaneous. He said he would have come to see the Shimerdas before, but he had hired out to husk corn all the fall, and since winter began he had been going to the school by the mill to learn English along with the little children. He told me he had a nice lady teacher and that he liked to go to school. At dinner, Grandfather talked to Jelinek more than he usually did to strangers. Will they be much disappointed because we cannot get a priest? he asked. Jelinek looked serious. Yes, sir, uh, that is very bad for them. Their father has done a great sin. He looked straight at Grandfather. Or Lord has said that. Grandfather seemed to like his frankness. We believe that too, Jelinek, but we believe that Mr. Shimerda's soul will come to its creator as well off without a priest. We believe that Christ is our only intercessor. The young man shook his head. I know how you think. My teacher at the school has explained but I have seen too much. I believe in prayer for the dead. I have seen too much. We asked him what he meant. He glanced round the table. You want I shall tell you? When I was a little boy like this one, I began to help the priest at the altar. I made my first communion very young. What the church teach seemed plain to me. By and by war times come when the Austrians fight us. We have very many soldiers in camp near my village and the cholera break out in that camp, and the men die like flies. All day long our priests go about there to give the sacrament to dying men, and I go with him to carry the vessels with the holy sacrament. Everybody that go near that camp catch the sickness but me and the priest. But we have no sickness, we have no fear. 
because we carry that blood and that body of Christ, and it preserve us. He paused, looking at Grandfather. That I know, Mr. Burden, for it happened to myself. All the soldiers know, too. When we walk along the road, the old priest and me, we meet all the time soldiers marching and officers on horse. All those officers, when they see what I carry under the cloth, I pull up their horses and kneel down on the ground in the road until we pass. So I feel very bad for my countryman to die without the sacrament and to die in a bad way for his soul, and I feel sad for his family. We had listened attentively. It was impossible not to admire his frank, manly faith. I'm always glad to meet a young man who thinks seriously about these things, said Grandfather, and I would never be the one to say you were not in God's care when you were among the soldiers. After dinner, it was decided that young Jelinek should hook our two strong black farm horses to the scraper and break a road through to the Shimurdas, so that a wagon could go when it was necessary. Fuchs, who was the only cabinet maker in the neighborhood, was set to work on a coffin. Jelinek put on his long wolfskin coat, and when we admired it, he told us that he had shot and skinned the coyotes, and the young man who batched with them, Jan Buska, who had been a fur worker in Vienna, made the coat. From the windmill I watched Jelinek come out of the barn with the blacks, and work his way up the hillside toward the cornfield. Sometimes he was completely hidden by the clouds of snow that rose about him. Then he and the horse would emerge black and shining. Our heavy carpenter's bench had to be brought from the barn and carried down into the kitchen. Fuchs selected boards from a pile of planks Grandfather had hauled out from town in the fall to make a new floor for the oats bin. When at last the lumber and tools were assembled, and the doors were closed again and the cold drafts shut out, Grandfather rode away to meet the coroner at the Shimurdas, and Fuchs took out his coat and settled down to work. I sat on his work table and watched him. He did not touch his tools at first, but figured for a long while on a piece of paper, and measured the planks and made marks on them. While he was thus engaged, he whistled softly to himself, or teasingly pulled at his half-ear. Grandmother moved about quietly, so as not to disturb him. At last he folded his ruler and turned a cheerful face to us. "'The hardest part of my job's done,' he announced. "'It's the head end of it that comes hard with me, especially when I'm out of practice. "'Last time I made one of these, Mrs. Burden,' he continued, as he sorted and tried his chisels, "'was for a fellow in the Black Tiger Mine, up above Silverton, Colorado. "'The mouth of that mine goes right into the face of the cliff, "'and they used to put us in a bucket and run us over on a trolley and shoot us into the shaft.' The bucket traveled across a box canyon three hundred feet deep and about a third full of water. Two Swedes that fell out of that bucket once and hit the water, feet down. If you'll believe it, they went to work the next day. Can't kill a Swede. But in my time, a little Italian tried the high dive, and it turned out different with him. We was snowed in then, like we are now, and I happened to be the only man in camp that could make a coffin for him. It's a handy thing to know when you knock about like I've done. We'd be hard put to it now, if you didn't know, Otto, Grandmother said. Yes, um, Fuchs admitted with modest pride. So few folks does know how to make a good tight box that'll turn water. I sometimes wonder if there'll be anybody about to do it for me. However, I'm not at all particular that way. All afternoon, wherever one went in the house, one could hear the panting wheeze of the saw or the pleasant purring of the plane. They were such cheerful noises, seeming to promise new things for living people. It was a pity that those freshly plain pine boards were to be put underground so soon. The lumber was hard to work because it was full of frost, and the boards gave off a sweet smell of pine woods as the heap of yellow shavings grew higher and higher. I wonder why Fuchs had not stuck to cabinet work. He settled down to it with such ease and content. He handled the tools as if he liked to feel them, and when he planed, his hands went back and forth over the boards in an eager, beneficent way, as if he were blessing them. He broke out now and then into German hymns, as if this occupation brought back old times to him. At four o'clock Mr. Bushy, the postmaster, with another neighbor who lived east of us, stopped in to get warm. They were on their way to the Shimurdas. The news of what had happened over there had somehow got abroad through the snow-block country. Grandmother gave the visitors sugar cakes and hot coffee. Before these callers were gone, the brother of the widow Stevens, who lived on the Black Hawk Road, drew up at our door, and after him came the father of the German family, our nearest neighbors on the south. They dismounted and joined us in the dining room. 
They were all eager for any details about the suicide, and they were greatly concerned as to where Mr. Shimerda would be buried. The nearest Catholic cemetery was at Black Hawk, and it might be weeks before a wagon could get so far. Besides, Mr. Bushy and Grandmother were sure that a man who had killed himself could not be buried in a Catholic graveyard. There was a burying ground over by the Norwegian church, west of Squaw Creek. Perhaps the Norwegians would take Mr. Shimerda in. After our visitors rode away in single file over the hill, we returned to the kitchen. Grandmother began to make the icing for a chocolate cake, and Otto again filled the house with the exciting expectant song of the plain. One pleasant thing about this was that everybody talked more than usual. I had never heard the postmaster say anything but, Only papers today, or, I've got a sack full of mail for you, until this afternoon. Grandmother always talked, dear woman, to herself or to the Lord, if there was no one else to listen. But Grandfather was naturally taciturn, and Jake and Otto were often so tired after supper that I used to feel as if I were surrounded by a wall of silence. Now everyone seemed eager to talk. That afternoon Fuchs told me story after story, about the Black Tiger Mine, and about violent deaths and casual burrings, and the queer fancies of dying men. You never really knew a man, he said, until you saw him die. Most men were game and went without a grudge. The postmaster going home stopped to say that Grandfather would bring the coroner back with him to spend the night. The officers of the Norwegian church, he told us, had held a meeting and decided that the Norwegian graveyard could not extend its hospitality to Mr. Shimerda. Grandmother was indignant. If these foreigners are so clannish, Mr. Bushy, we'll have to have an American graveyard that will be more liberal-minded. I'll get right after Josiah to start one in the spring. If anything was to happen to me, I don't want the Norwegians holding inquisitions over me to see whether I'm good enough to be laid amongst them. Soon Grandfather returned, bringing with him Anton Jelinek and that important person, the coroner. He was a mild, flurried old man, a Civil War veteran, with one sleeve hanging empty. He seemed to find this case very perplexing, and said if it had not been for Grandfather he would have sworn out a warrant against Krajik. The way he acted and the way his axe fit the wound was enough to convict any man. Although it was perfectly clear that Mr. Shimerda had killed himself, Jake and the coroner thought something ought to be done to Krajiek because he behaved like a guilty man. He was badly frightened, certainly, and perhaps he even felt some stirrings of remorse for his indifference to the old man's misery and loneliness. At supper the man ate like Vikings, and the chocolate cake, which I had hoped would linger on until tomorrow in a mutilated condition, disappeared on the second round. They talked excitedly about where they should bury Mr. Shimerda. I gathered that the neighbors were all disturbed and shocked about something. It developed that Mrs. Shimerda and Ambrosch wanted the old man buried on the southwest corner of their own land. Indeed, under the very stake that marked the corner. Grandfather had explained to Ambrosch that some day, when the country was put under fence and the roads were confined to section lines, two roads would cross exactly on that corner. But Ambrosch only said, It makes no matter. Grandfather asked Jelinek whether in the old country there was some superstition to the effect that a suicide must be buried at the crossroads. Jelinek said he didn't know. He seemed to remember hearing there had once been such a custom in Bohemia. Mrs. Shimerda has made up her mind, he added. I try to persuade her, and say it looks bad for her to all the neighbors, but she say so it must be. There I will bury him if I dig the grave myself, she say. I have to promise her I help Ambrosch make the grave tomorrow. Grandfather smoothed his beard and looked judicial. I don't know whose wish should decide the matter if not hers, but if she thinks she will live to see the people of this country right over that old man's head, she is mistaken. Book One, The Shimerdas, Chapter Sixteen Mr. Shimerda lay dead in the barn four days, and on the fifth they buried him. All day Friday, Jelinek was off with Ambrosch digging the grave, chopping out the frozen earth with old axes. On Saturday we breakfasted before daylight and got into the wagon with the coffin. Jake and Jelinek went ahead on horseback to cut the body loose from the pool of blood in which it was frozen fast to the ground. When Grandmother and I went to the Shimerda's house, we found the women folk alone. Ambrosch and Marek were at the barn. Mrs. Shimerda sat crouching by the stove. Antonia was washing dishes. When she saw me, she ran out of her dark corner and threw her arms around me. Oh, Jimmy, she sobbed. 
What do you think for my lovely papa? It seemed to me that I could feel her heart breaking as she clung to me. Mrs. Shimerda, sitting on the stump by the stove, kept looking over her shoulder toward the door while the neighbors were arriving. They came on horseback, all except the postmaster, who brought his family in a wagon over the only broken wagon trail. The widow Stevens rode up from her farm eight miles down the Black Hawk Road. The cold drove the women into the cave house, and it was soon crowded. A fine, sleety snow was beginning to fall, and everyone was afraid of another storm and anxious to have the burial over with. Grandfather and Jelinek came to tell Mrs. Shimerda that it was time to start. After bundling her mother up in clothes the neighbors had brought, Antonia put on an old cape from our house and the rabbit skin that our father had made for her. Four men carried Mr. Shimerda's box up the hill. Kradziak slung along behind them. The coffin was too wide for the door, so it was put down on the slope outside. I slipped out from the cave and looked at Mr. Shimerda. He was lying on his side, with his knees drawn up. His body was draped in a black shawl, and his head was bandaged in white muslin, like a mummy's. One of his long, shapely hands lay out on the black cloth. That was all one could see of him. Mrs. Shimerda came out and placed an open prayer book against the body, making the sign of the cross on the bandaged head with her fingers. Ambrosch knelt down and made the same gesture, and after him Antonia and Marek. Yulka hung back. Her mother pushed her forward and kept saying something to her over and over. Yulka knelt down, shut her eyes, and put out her hand a little way, but she drew it back and began to cry wildly. She was afraid to touch the bandage. Mrs. Shimerda caught her by the shoulders and pushed her toward the coffin, but Grandmother interfered. "'No, Mrs. Shimerda,' she said firmly. "'I won't stand by and see that child frightened into spasms. "'She is too little to understand what you want of her. "'Let her alone.' At a look from Grandfather, Fuchs and Jelinek placed the lid on the box and began to nail it down over Mr. Shimerda. I was afraid to look at Antonia. She put her arms round Yulka and held the little girl close to her. The coffin was put into the wagon. We drove slowly away against the fine, icy snow which cut our faces like a sandblast. When we reached the grave, it looked a very little spot in that snow-covered waste. The men took the coffin to the edge of the hole and lowered it with ropes. We stood about watching them, and the powdery snow lay without melting on the caps and shoulders of the men and the shawls of the women. Jelinek spoke in a persuasive tone to Mrs. Shimerda, and then turned to Grandfather. She says, Mr. Burden, she is very glad if you can make some prayer for him here in English, for the neighbors to understand. Grandmother looked anxiously at Grandfather. He took off his hat, and the other men did likewise. I thought his prayer remarkable. I still remember it. He began, O oh, great and just God! No man among us knows what the sleeper knows, nor is it for us to judge what lies between him and thee. He prayed that if any man there had been remiss toward the stranger come from a far country, God would forgive him and soften his heart. He recalled the promises to the widow and the fatherless, and asked God to smooth the way before this widow and her children, and to incline the hearts of men to deal justly with her. In closing, he said we were leaving Mr. Shimerda at thy judgment seat, which is also thy mercy seat. All the time he was praying, Grandmother watched him through the black fingers of her glove, and when he said, Amen, I thought she looked satisfied with him. She turned to Otto and whispered, Can't you start a hymn, Fuchs? It would seem less heathenish. Fuchs glanced about to see if there was general approval of her suggestion, then began, Jesus, lover of my soul, and all the men and women took it up after him. Whenever I have heard the hymn since, it has made me remember that white waste and the little group of people, and the bluish air full of fine eddying snow, like long veils flying, while the nearer waters roll, while the tempest still is high. Years afterward, when the open grazing days were over, and the red grass had been plowed under and under until it had almost disappeared from the prairie, when all the fields were under fence and the roads no longer ran about like wild things, but followed the surveyed section lines, Mr. Shimerda's grave was still there, with a sagging wire fence around it and an unpainted wooden cross. 
As Grandfather had predicted, Mrs. Shimerda never saw the roads going over his head. The road from the north curved a little to the east just there, and the road from the west swung out a little to the south, so that the grave with its tall red grass that was never mowed was like a little island, and at twilight, under a new moon or the clear evening star, the dusty roads used to look like soft gray rivers flowing past it. I never came upon the place without emotion, and in all that country it was a spot most dear to me. I loved the dim superstition, the propitiatory intent that had put the grave there, and still more I loved the spirit that could not carry out the sentence, the air of the surveyed lines, the clemency of the soft earth roads, along which the homecoming wagons rattled after sunset. Never a tired driver passed the wooden cross, I am sure, without wishing well to the sleeper. Book One, The Shimerdas, Chapter Seventeen When spring came after that hard winter, one could not get enough of the nimble air. Every morning I wakened with a fresh consciousness that winter was over. There were none of the signs of spring for which I used to watch in Virginia, no budding woods or blooming gardens. There was only spring itself, the throb of it, the light restlessness, the vital essence of it everywhere, in the sky, in the swift clouds, in the pale sunshine, in the warm high wind, rising suddenly, sinking suddenly, impulsive and playful like a big puppy that pawed you and then lay down to be petted. If I had been tossed down blindfold on that red prairie, I should have known that it was spring. Everywhere now there was the smell of burning grass. Our neighbors burnt off their pasture before the new grass made a start, so that the fresh growth would not be mixed with the dead stand of last year. Those light, swift fires running about the country seemed a part of the same kindling that was in the air. The Shimerdas were in their new log house by then. The neighbors had helped them to build it in March. It stood directly in front of their old cave, which they used as a cellar. The family were now fairly equipped to begin their struggle with the soil. They had four comfortable rooms to live in, a new windmill, bought on credit, a chicken house and poultry. Mrs. Shimerda had paid Grandfather ten dollars for a milk cow, and was to give him fifteen more as soon as they harvested their first crop. When I rode up to the Shimerdas one bright windy afternoon in April, Yulka ran out to meet me. It was to her now that I gave reading lessons. Antonia was busy with other things. I tied my pony and went into the kitchen where Mrs. Shimerda was baking bread, chewing poppy seeds as she worked. By this time she could speak enough English to ask me a great many questions about what our men were doing in the fields. She seemed to think that my elders withheld helpful information, and that from me she might get valuable secrets. On this occasion she asked me very craftily when Grandfather expected to begin planting corn. I told her, adding that he thought we should have a dry spring, and that the corn would not be held back by too much rain, as it had been last year. She gave me a shrewd glance. He not Jesus, she blustered. He not know about the wet and the dry. I did not answer her. What was the use? As I sat waiting for the hour when Ambrosch and Antonia would return from the fields, I watched Mrs. Shimerda at her work. She took from the oven a coffee cake which she wanted to keep warm for supper, and wrapped it in a quilt stuffed with feathers. I have seen her put even a roast goose in this quilt to keep it hot. When the neighbors were there building the new house, they saw her do this, and the story got abroad that the Shimerdas kept their food in their feather beds. When the sun was dropping low, Antonia came up the big south draw with her team. How much older she had grown in eight months! She had come to us a child, and now she was a tall, strong young girl, although her fifteenth birthday had just slipped by. I ran out and met her as she brought her horses up to the windmill to water them. She wore the boots her father had so thoughtfully taken off before he shot himself, and his old fur cap, her outgrown cotton dress switched about her calves over the boot tops. She kept her sleeves rolled up all day, and her arms and throat were burned as brown as a sailor's. Her neck came up strongly out of her shoulders, like the bole of a tree out of the turf. One sees that draft horse neck among the peasant women in all old countries. She greeted me gaily and began at once to tell me how much plowing she had done that day. Ambrose, she said, was on the north quarter, breaking sod with the oxen. Jim, you ask Jake how much he plowed today. I don't want that Jake get more done in one day than me. I want we have very much corn this fall. While the horses drew in the water and nosed each other, and then drank again, Antonia sat down on the windmill step and rested her head on her hand. 
You see the big prayer fire from your place last night? I hope your grandpa ain't lose no stacks? No, we didn't. I came to ask you something, Tony. Grandmother wants to know if you can't go to the term of school that begins next week over at the sod schoolhouse. She says there's a good teacher, and you'd learn a lot. Antonia stood up, lifting and dropping her shoulders as if they were stiff. I ain't got time to learn. I can walk like man's now. My mother can't say no more how Ambrosch do all and nobody to help him. I can work as much as him. School is all right for little boys. I help make this land one good farm. She clucked to her team and started for the barn. I walked beside her, feeling vexed. Was she going to grow up boastful like her mother, I wondered. Before we reached the stable, I felt something tense in her silence, and glancing up, I saw that she was crying. She turned her face from me and looked off at the red streak of dying light over the dark prairie. I climbed up into the loft and threw down the hay for her, while she unharnessed her team. We walked slowly back toward the house. Ambrosch had come in from the north quarter and was watering his oxen at the tank. Antonia took my hand. Sometime you will tell me all those nice things you learn at the school, won't you, Jimmy? She asked with a sudden rush of feeling in her voice. My father, he went much to school. He know a, a great deal how to make the fine cloth like what you not got here. Play horn and violin and he read so many books that the priests in Bohemi came to talk to him. You won't forget my father, Jim? No, I said. I will never forget him. Mrs. Shimerda asked me to stay for supper. After Ambrosch and Antonia had washed the field dust from their hands and faces at the wash basin by the kitchen door, we sat down at the oilcloth covered table. Mrs. Shimerda ladled meal mush out of an iron pot and poured milk on it. After the mush, we had fresh bread and sorghum molasses and coffee with the cake that had been kept warm in the feathers. Antonia and Ambrosch were talking in Bohemian, disputing about which of them had done more plowing that day. Mrs. Shimerda egged them on, chuckling while she gobbled her food. Presently Ambrosch said suddenly in English, You take them ox tomorrow and try the sod plow. Then you not be so smart. His sister laughed. Don't be mad. I know it's awful hard work for break sod. I milk the cow for you tomorrow if you want. Mrs. Shimerda turned quickly to me. That cow not give so much milk like what your grandpa say. If he make talk about fifteen dollars, I send him back the cow. He doesn't talk about the fifteen dollars, I exclaim indignantly. He doesn't find fault with people. He say I break his saw when we build, and I never, grumbled Ambrosch. I knew he had broken the saw, and then hid it and lied about it. I began to wish I had not stayed for supper. Everything was disagreeable to me. Antonia ate so noisily now, like a man, and she yawned often at the table and kept stretching her arms over her head as if they ached. Grandmother had said, Heavy field work will spoil that girl. She'll lose all her nice ways and get rough ones. She had lost them already. After supper I rode home through the sad, soft spring twilight. Since winter I had seen very little of Antonia. She was out in the fields from sun up until sundown. If I rode over to see her, where she was plowing, she stopped at the end of a row to chat for a moment, then gripped her plow handles, plucked her team, and waded on down the furrow, making me feel that she was now grown up and had no time for me. On Sundays she helped her mother make garden or sewed all day. Grandfather was pleased with Antonia. When he complained of her, he only smiled and said, She will help some fellow get ahead in the world. Nowadays Tony could talk of nothing but the prices of things, or how much she could lift and endure. She was too proud of her strength. I knew, too, that Ambrosch put upon her some chores a girl ought not to do, and that the farmhands around the country joked in a nasty way about it. Whenever I saw her come up the furrow, shouting to her beasts, sunburned, sweaty, her dress open at the neck, and her throat and chest dust-plattered, I used to think of a tone in which poor Mr. Shimerda, who could say so little, yet managed to say so much when he exclaimed, My Antonia! Book One, The Shimerdas, Chapter Eighteen After I began to go to the country school, I saw less of the Bohemians. We were sixteen pupils at the sod schoolhouse, and we all came on horseback and brought our dinner. My schoolmates were none of them very interesting, but I somehow felt that by making comrades of them, 
I was getting even with Antonia for her indifference. Since the father's death, Ambrosch was more than ever the head of the house, and he seemed to direct the feelings as well as the fortunes of his women folk. Antonia often quoted his opinions to me, and she let me see that she admired him, while she thought of me only as a little boy. Before the spring was over, there was a distinct coldness between us and the Shimurdas. It came about in this way. One Sunday I rode over there with Jake to get a horse collar which Ambrosch had borrowed from him and not returned. It was a beautiful blue morning. The buffalo peas were blooming in pink and purple masses along the roadside, and the larks perched on last year's dried sunflower stalks were singing straight at the sun, their heads thrown back and their yellow breasts a-quiver. The wind blew about us in warm, sweet gusts. We rode slowly, with a pleasant sense of Sunday indolence. We found the Shimurdas working just as if it were a weekday. Marek was cleaning up the stable, and Antonia and her mother were making garden, off across the pond in the drawhead. Ambrosch was up on the windmill tower, oiling the wheel. He came down not very cordially. When Jake asked for the collar, he grunted and scratched his head. The collar belonged to Grandfather, of course, and Jake, feeling responsible for it, flared up. "'Now don't you say you haven't gotten Ambrosh, because I know you have, and if you ain't a-going to look for it, I will.' Ambrosh shrugged his shoulders and sauntered down the hill toward the stable. I could see that it was one of his mean days. Presently he returned carrying a collar that had been badly used, trampled in the dirt and gnawed by rats until the hair was sticking out of it. "'This what you want?' he asked surlily. Jake jumped off his horse. I saw a wave of red come up under the rough stubble on his face. That ain't the piece of harness I loaned you, Ambrosh. Or if it is, you've used it shameful. I ain't a-going to carry such a looking thing back to Mr. Burden. Ambrosh dropped the collar on the ground. All right, he said coolly, took up his oil can and began to climb the mill. Jake caught him by the belt of his trousers and yanked him back. Ambrosh's feet had scarcely touched the ground when he lunged out with a vicious kick at Jake's stomach. Fortunately, Jake was in such a position that he could dodge it. This was not the sort of thing country boys did when they played at fisticuffs, and Jake was furious. He landed Ambrosh a blow on the head. It sounded like the crack of an axe on a cow pumpkin. Ambrosh dropped over, stunned. We heard squeals and, looking up, saw Antonia and her mother coming on the run. They did not take the path around the pond, but plunged through the muddy water without even lifting their skirts. They came on, screaming and clawing the air. By this time, Ambrosh had come to his senses and was sputtering his nosebleed. Jake sprang into his saddle. Let's get out of this, Jim, he called. Mrs. Shimurda threw her hands over her head and clutched as if she were going to pull down lightning. Law! Law! she shrieked after us. Law for knock my Ambrosh down. I never like you no more. Jake and Jim Burden, Antonia panted. No friends, any more. Jake stopped and turned his horse for a second. Well, you're a damn ungrateful lot, the whole pack of you, he shouted back. I guess the Burdens can get along without you. You've been a sight of trouble to them anyhow. We rode away, feeling so outraged that the fine morning was spoiled for us. I hadn't a word to say and poor Jake was white as paper and trembling all over. It made him sick to get so angry. They ain't the same, Jimmy, he kept saying in a hurt tone. These foreigners ain't the same. You can't trust them to be fair. It's dirty to kick a feller. You heard how the women turn on you, and after all we went through on accent of em last winter, they ain't to be trusted. I don't want to see you get too thick with any of em. I'll never be friends with them again, Jake, I declared hotly. I believe they are all like Kradziak and Ambrosh underneath. Grandfather heard our story with a twinkle in his eye. He advised Jake to write to town tomorrow, go to a justice of the peace, tell him he had knocked young Shimurda down and pay his fine. Then if Mrs. Shimurda was inclined to make trouble, her son was still under age, she would be forestalled. Jake said he might as well take the wagon and haul to market the pig he had been fattening. On Monday, about an hour after Jake had started, we saw Mrs. Shimurda and her Ambrosh proudly driving by, looking neither to the right nor left. As they rattled out of sight down the Black Hawk Road, Grandfather chuckled, saying he had rather expected she would follow the matter up. 
Jake paid his fine with the ten-dollar bill grandfather had given him for that purpose. But when the Shemurdas found that Jake sold his pig in town that day, Ambrosch worked it out in his shrewd head that Jake had to sell his pig to pay his fine. This theory afforded the Shemurdas great satisfaction, apparently. For weeks afterward, whenever Jake and I met Antonia on her way to the post office, or going along the road with her work team, she would clap her hands and call to us in a spiteful, crowing voice, Jakey, Jakey, sell the pig and pay the slap. Otto pretended not to be surprised at Antonia's behavior. He only lifted his brows and said, You can't tell me anything new about a check. I'm an Austrian. Grandfather was never a party to what Jake called her feud with the Shemurdas. Ambrosch and Antonia always greeted him respectfully, and he asked them about their affairs and gave them advice as usual. He thought the future looked hopeful for them. Ambrosch was a far-seeing fellow. He soon realized that his oxen were too heavy for any work except breaking sod, and he succeeded in selling them to a newly arrived German. With the money he bought another team of horses, which Grandfather selected for him. Merrick was strong, and Ambrosch worked him hard. But he could never teach him to cultivate corn, I remember. The one idea that had ever got through poor Merrick's thick head was that all exertion was meritorious. He always bore down on the handles of the cultivator and drove the blades so deep into the earth that the horses were soon exhausted. In June, Ambrosch went to work at Mr. Bushy's for a week and took Merrick with him at full wages. Mrs. Shimerda then drove the second cultivator. She and Antonia worked in the fields all day and did the chores at night. While the two women were running the place alone, one of the new horses got colic and gave them a terrible fright. Antonia had gone down to the barn one night to see that all was well before she went to bed, and she noticed that one of the roans was swollen about the middle and stood with its head hanging. She mounted another horse without waiting to saddle him, and hammered on her door just as we were going to bed. Grandfather answered her knock. He did not send one of his men, but rode back with her himself, taking a syringe and an old piece of carpet he kept for hot applications when her horses were sick. He found Mrs. Shimerda sitting by the horse with her lantern, groaning and wringing her hands. It took but a few moments to release the gases pent up in the poor beast, and the two women heard the rush of wind and saw the roan visibly diminish in girth. "'If I lose that horse, Mr. Burden,' Antonia exclaimed, "'I never stay here till Ambrosch come home. I go drown myself in the pond before morning.' When Ambrosch came back from Mr. Bushy's, we learned that he had given Merrick's wages to the priest at Blackhawk for masses for their father's soul. Grandmother thought Antonia needed shoes more than Mr. Shimerda needed prayers, but Grandfather said tolerantly, If he can spare six dollars, pinched as he is, it shows he believes what he professes. It was Grandfather who brought about a reconciliation with the Shimerdas. One morning he told us that the small grain was coming on so well he thought he would begin to cut his wheat on the 1st of July. He would need more men, and if it were agreeable to every one, he would engage Ambrosch for the reaping and thrashing, as the Shimerdas had no small grain of their own. I think, Emmeline, he concluded, I will ask Antonia to come over and help you in the kitchen. She will be glad to earn something, and it will be a good time to end misunderstandings. I may as well ride over this morning and make arrangements. Do you want to go with me, Jim? His tone told me that he had already decided for me. After breakfast, we set off together. When Mrs. Shimerda saw us coming, she ran from her door down into the draw behind the stable, as if she did not want to meet us. Grandfather smiled to himself while he tied his horse, and we followed her. Behind the barn we came upon a funny sight. The cow had evidently been grazing somewhere in the draw. Mrs. Shimerda had run to the animal, pulled up the lariat pin, and when we came upon her she was trying to hide the cow in an old cave in the bank. As the hole was narrow and dark, the cow held back, and the old woman was slapping and pushing at her hindquarters, trying to spank her into the draw side. Grandfather ignored her singular occupation and greeted her politely. "'Good morning, Mrs. Shimerda. Can you tell me where I will find Ambrosch? Which field?' He with the sod cord. She pointed toward the north, still standing in front of the cow as if she hoped to conceal it. His sod corn will be good for fodder this winter, said Grandfather encouragingly. And where is Antonia? She go with him. Mrs. Shimerda kept wiggling her bare feet about nervously in the dust. Very well, I will ride up there. 
I want them to come over and help me cut my oats and wheat next month. I will pay them wages. Good morning. By the way, Mrs. Shimerda, he said as he turned up the path, I think we may as well call it square about the cow. She started and clutched the rope tighter. Seeing that she did not understand, Grandfather turned back. You need not pay me anything more. No more money. The cow is yours. Pay no more. Keep cow, she asked in a bewildered tone, her narrow eyes snapping at us in the sunlight. Exactly. Pay no more. Keep cow, he nodded. Mrs. Shimerda dropped the rope, ran after us, and crouching down beside Grandfather, she took his hand and kissed it. I doubt if he had ever been so much embarrassed before. I was a little startled, too. Somehow that seemed to bring the old world very close. We rode away laughing, and Grandfather said, I expect she thought we had come to take the cow away for certain, Jim. I wonder if she wouldn't have scratched a little if we'd laid hold of that lariat rope. Our neighbors seemed glad to make peace with us. The next Sunday Mrs. Shimerda came over and brought Jake a pair of socks she had knitted. She presented them with an air of great magnanimity, saying, Now you not come any more for knock my ambrosh down. Jake laughed sheepishly. I don't want to have no trouble with ambrosh. If he let me alone, I'll let him alone. If he slap you, we ain't got no pig for pay the fine she said insinuatingly. Jake was not at all disconcerted. Have the last word, ma'am, he said cheerfully. It's a lady's privilege. Book One, The Shimerdas, Chapter Nineteen July came on with that breathless, brilliant heat which makes the plains of Kansas and Nebraska the best corn country in the world. It seemed as if we could hear the corn growing in the night. Under the stars one caught a faint crackling in the dewy, heavy-odored cornfields where the feathered stalks stood so juicy and green. If all the great plain from the Missouri to the Rocky Mountains had been under glass, and the heat regulated by a thermometer, it could not have been better for the yellow tassels that were ripening and fertilizing each other day by day. The cornfields were far apart in those times, with miles of wild grazing land between. It took a clear, meditative eye like my grandfather's to foresee that they would enlarge and multiply until they would be, not the Shimerda's cornfields or Mr. Bushy's, but the world's cornfields, that their yield would be one of the great economic facts, like the wheat crop of Russia, which underlie all the activities of men, in peace or war. The burning sun of those few weeks, with occasional rains at night, secured the corn. After the milky ears were once formed, we had little to fear from dry weather. The men were working so hard in the wheat fields that they did not notice the heat, though I was kept busy carrying water for them, and Grandmother and Antonia had so much to do in the kitchen that they could not have told whether one day was hotter than another. Each morning, while the dew was still on the grass, Antonia went with me up to the garden to get early vegetables for dinner. Grandmother made her wear a sunbonnet but as soon as we reached the garden she threw it on the grass and let her hair fly in the breeze. I remember how, as we bent over the pea vines, beads of perspiration used to gather on her upper lip, like a little mustache. Oh, better I like to work out of doors than in a house, she used to sing joyfully. I not care that your grandmother say it makes me like a man. I like to be like a man. She would toss her head and ask me to feel the muscles swell in her brown arm. We were glad to have her in the house. She was so gay and responsive that one did not mind her heavy running step or her clattery way with pans. Grandmother was in high spirits during the weeks that Antonia worked for us. All the nights were close and hot during that harvest season. The harvester slept in the hayloft because it was cooler there than in the house. I used to lie in my bed by the open window, watching the heat lightning play softly along the horizon or looking up at the gaunt frame of the windmill against the blue night sky. One night there was a beautiful electric storm, though not enough rain fell to damage the cut grain. The men went down to the barn immediately after supper, and when the dishes were washed, Antonia and I climbed up on the slanting roof of the chicken house to watch the clouds. The thunder was loud and metallic, like the rattle of sheet iron, and the lightning broke in great zigzags across the heavens, making everything stand out and come close to us for a moment. Half the sky was checkered with black thunderheads, 
but all the west was luminous and clear. In the lightning flashes it looked like deep blue water, with a sheen of moonlight on it, and the mottled part of the sky was like marble pavement, like the quay of some splendid seacoast city, doomed to destruction. Great warm splashes of rain fell on her upturned faces. One black cloud, no bigger than a little boat, drifted out into the clear space unattended and kept moving westward. All about us we could hear the felty beat of the raindrops on the soft dust of the farmyard. Grandmother came to the door and said it was late and we would get wet out there. In a minute we come, Antonia called back to her. I like your grandmother and all things here, she sighed. I wish my papa lived to see the summer. I wish no winter ever come again. It will be summer a long while yet, I reassured her. Why aren't you always nice like this, Tony? How nice? Why, just like this, like yourself. Why do you all the time try to be like Ambrosch? She put her arms under her head and lay back, looking up at the sky. If I live here, like you, that is different. Things will be easy for you, but they will be hard for us. End of chapter 19 Recording by Stephanie Dupal de Martin